that point, it started to appear. They had large, dark eyes, claw-like hands. I began sensing and knowing and feeling. I do believe in life after death. I mean, I've been there. We have not scratched the surface of what the mind can do. It's a connection with the unknown. Welcome to Sightings. I'm Tim White. For one family in the Midwest, owning their own business was a dream come true. But now that business has become a constant source of terror. The family, who wishes to remain anonymous, believes that they're plagued by a malicious poltergeist who's out to destroy their dream and them. It's an unlikely setting for this real-life horror story. America's heartland, where the promise of the American dream can still be realized. Clean air and water, safe neighborhoods, a place where you can still buy a house and start your own business. All the reasons why the King family came here to raise their children and why they want to stay. But staying means confronting an evil force that seems to have possessed the family. One night I went to bed in the early AM and I woke up and my daughter, who was a, not quite a year old, still in diapers. She wasn't even walking. She could stand. I woke up the next morning and I felt pressure on my jaw real hard. And when I woke up and I looked up, my baby is standing straddled on my neck and she's got a butcher knife shoved down my throat. Her eyes were open and she just kind of looked at me and she started screaming like I'd woke her up, but her eyes were open. The bizarre, violent episodes began in 1987, just after the Kings purchased this home and motel. The safe haven they'd sought here turned into a waking nightmare. We could hear pounding in the walls, um, Screaming, we heard chanting, we heard singing. Um, Obviously, started flying across the room. I'd wake up with um, bruises, where it looked like somebody just beat, beat me really bad, and um, bite marks. I was looking at toward the hallway, and it stepped, like stepped out of the wall, and stood there, what seemed to me like an eternity, and I just couldn't believe it. I was like. When the Kings first came here and saw the home at the attached motel, it was love at first sight. But in retrospect, the Kings believed there were warning signs. The $60,000 asking price was reduced to $24,000 when the family made a serious offer. There were whisperings about a gruesome murder-suicide in the house. The former caretakers confirmed these suspicions. There was a lady that lived here at one time that was supposed to have committed suicide. And the way I understand it, she was supposed to have been really mean to her father-in-law. He was an old man. I never got any rest. Somebody was on my bed jumping continuously. My bed would move. They told me the house was haunted to start out with, but I just didn't stay around because, you know, hey, something bothered you, get away from it. After the Kings moved in, encounters with the unknown force intensified. A mysterious stain appeared above the fireplace. The spot was sandblasted, but the stain came back. Fresh paint and new wallpaper immediately peeled off the walls, and spontaneous fires kept erupting near the attic. We thought somehow somebody was getting into the house, had keys or something, and for whatever reason was setting fires, trying to, to burn us out or something. And we talked, we set the children down and talked to them. We said, lock everything up. If you see any strange people or cars, come tell us. Well, I took my daughter to the bathroom, and she looked up at me, these, these you know, real serious eyes, and said, Mommy, she said, Daddy didn't start the first fire, and she said, the ghosts are setting the house on fire. And she meant it. I mean, you look in her eyes and just say, she meant what she was saying. The haunting has taken its toll on six-year-old Ashley. It's hard for her to talk about her experiences, even with her own father. Maybe I can get you to uh, talk a little bit about what went on in the house or something? Well, let me ask you. Huh? Don't be afraid about it. In desperation, the Kings consulted a parapsychologist specializing in poltergeists. They were having poltergeist-like activity in the house, which to me meant that things of a shadowy nature were taking place. I also felt that the children were in danger, or could be in danger. I recommended strongly that they not be brought back into the house until the place was cleared. But with their life savings in the house, the Kings were trapped. 
After Dr. Moscow's visit, Doretta began to have terrifying visions of a grisly murder. Was she seeing the ghostly images of a deadly crime? first time that this happened, I had put my daughter, who at the time was like a year and a half old, she was a baby, I put her in the tub, and she was standing here, and I was sitting on the side of the tub, and I felt that jolt. It felt just like somebody was, was running a movie projector on a wall. It was vivid color. I started seeing, I want you call the images or whatever, of a man, and the man was sitting on the side of the tub fighting with the woman, and he killed her. And I mean, that's like I felt her. She released, and it was over. And then, you know, the little girl, he hit her the first time with the shovel. And, um... <laughs> I'm sorry. I felt the emotion. Um, she knew he was hurting her. And he, she screamed, Mommy. And Mommy was already sliding down. And he hit the little girl. And the first time she hit the wall. So he hit her again. And then her little head blood just sort of, you know, kind of splattered on all through her little hair. And then he drug them over there. It got to the point and bad enough where me and Steven would even stay awake at night and just make sure we didn't feel anything or see anything happening to Doretta because she seemed to be at one point getting the, the most attention, I guess, if you want to put it that way. Uh, she was being almost like violated. And then it moved away from me onto the children and they were actually being bitten. Ashley got the worst of that. She would scream and, and say, make them stop. And uh, one time I, I jumped on top of her and I was really mad and I told him to bite me. And I could feel her skin underneath me. I could, I could feel it like it was depressing and I, I raised my arm up and there was bites all over. And they were like biting through me and they weren't biting me, but they, they were biting her. And that was horrible because I couldn't, I couldn't stop them from hurting them. Desperate to rid their lives of this terror, they turned to world-renowned parapsychologist Dr. William Roll for answers. And this particular home is located in a, in a triangle of high-tension wires, uh, leaving open the possibility that uh, the occurrences may be related to, to, that, to that situation. A home like this is a kind of hatchery for ghosts, you might say, because of the uh, electromagnetic fields. We accompanied Dr. Roll during his investigation. Three prominent psychics were brought in to try and identify the source of the disturbing poltergeist activity. I feel there was a murder here. Possible that there could be a body under this house, or bodies, too. Uh, I don't feel it's necessary to dig them up. I feel that these people can be released simply through understanding. The investigation proceeded. Finally, at 4.17 a.m., a breakthrough. The presence of an entity was strongly felt. Although our cameras couldn't pick up an image, Doretta felt she had made contact. He's here, I'm trying to convince him to show itself. Any idea where he might do that? He's standing right here. You gotta work with him. I mean, this is the first time he's ever even attempted to be nice. It's building. Right there. Where? In the, in Can the you touch where it is? Even one of our skeptical crew members felt the presence. I feel it, and I see right there. Yes, right here. We're negotiating here. My hair is standing on end. It's Come on, man. so strange. It's dissipated after all the activity of the evening. Okay. Calm down. There it was. Families who live in a home like this may experience because of the place they are at in their lives, may experience events that have happened in the past in this house, in a house like this. Uh, we seem to have, there seems to be something that we call place memories. It's not only brains and minds that hold memories, but places also hold memories. We raised the children that um, monsters weren't real and there wasn't ghosts and boogeymen. <laughs> and we raised them to be really secure in that. And when this happened, and when, when it all came about, suddenly the hopeless, our belief system and what we taught our children was turned upside down and shook. And they looked at us and it was that look of, you know, we trusted you. Despite the work of the parapsychologists, the Kings were finally forced out by the entity. They wanted a safer home for their children, but finances have made it impossible for them to abandon the home they own. 
They've had to move back, and no one can predict what awaits them now. Coming up next, was this Hawaiian paradise cursed? We were told, don't scare away the tourists. Or was it just local superstition? The people that had stayed there saw dead bodies floating in the ocean. They had uh, terrible, terrible odors in their rooms. In virtually every culture, burial grounds are considered sacred. Some are said to carry a curse for those who dare violate them. Perhaps it was such a curse that struck the Seven Seas Hotel, a hotel built on sacred ground in Hawaii. The native peoples of Hawaii respect the awesome power and beauty of nature because they believe that the same forces that created their island paradise can also destroy them. They believe the forces of nature are ruled by the gods. Break their laws and the gods will retaliate. Hawaiians believe ground that is sacred to the gods must be respected. For that reason, according to local beliefs, the Seven Seas Hotel should never have been built. Native Hawaiian people have a great deal of respect for what Westerners might, might consider superstitions. When Hurricane Eva destroyed the Seven Seas Hotel in 1982, many Hawaiians believed that it was an act of vengeance by angry gods. During construction of the hotel, an ancient Hawaiian burial site was unearthed. Some natives believed the site would be cursed unless it was blessed by a holy man, a kahuna. But developers dismissed the practice as superstition, and construction continued. In a way, there are just certain things that you have to do. When you build something, you have to have the land blessed, and according to all details, this was not blessed. When, if you're excavating, you uncover bones, they have to be disposed of properly, and apparently they were not disposed of properly here. So they were asking for trouble. Once the hotel opened, the gods seemed to make their presence known. The people that had stayed there saw dead bodies floating in the ocean. They had uh, terrible, terrible odors in their rooms. They had birds attack them in the dining room. Um, a lot of the local people that had originally started to work there experienced many, many eerie things, and a lot of them quit working. Me, I worked to one night. I was a night chief, okay? Then I was caught in my vegetables. Then I don't know from where that thing came, rainbow color, spinning like that against that icebox. So I saw the ground funny. I took that knife and I started cutting the shadow. I said, don't you ever bother me because I don't bother you. Julie Coe was 14 when she and her mother moved into the hotel in 1977. They stayed for six months in room 13. My mom would work late at night, and so I'd be home by myself doing my homework and what all. And they'd just play games with me all night long. The only way I got rid of them, an old local woman told me, she said they hate swearing. She said they absolutely hate swearing. And one night I had just had it, I couldn't, I couldn't sleep, I couldn't read, they were just making too much racket, they were making me very uncomfortable, and I got up on my bed and screamed every four-letter word I could think of in every combination I could think of. And by gosh, if they didn't settle down and leave me alone for the night. But you'd hear it like, every other night, the knives hitting in the wall, toilets flushing, people walking on the carpet after a while, you just get used to it. We were told, don't scare away the tourists. You know, if they hear spooky noises, don't tell spooky stories. You know, make an excuse for the toilets, anything. Seven Seas was a nice hotel. Not fabulous, but a nice view. So people came, but they didn't expect the spooks at night. The hotel was plagued by disturbing events. Then, finally, Hurricane Ewa roared in and destroyed the Seven Seas Hotel. Was it simply the force of nature at work? Or was it a deliberate retaliation by spiritual forces who were angered by the desecration of an ancient burial site? Locals believe Hurricane Iwa was the revenge of the gods. On the very same site where the Seven Seas Hotel was destroyed, a new condominium complex has been built. But before construction started this time, the land was blessed by a kahuna. Since the blessing, there have been no further incidents. Coming up, does the dead victim of an electrocution still haunt this house? 
Our cameras captured evidence that even we can't explain. Light in the kitchen's going on and off. Ghosts. Many parapsychologists believe that they're collections of electrical energy. And conventional scientists agree electromagnetism is all around us. But paranormal researchers take it one extraordinary step further. They believe electromagnetism has a personality, that it can be the outward manifestation of a tortured soul in limbo. On July 28, 1974, Larry Richard Roach, an unemployed electrician, ended his own life with one rifle blast to the chest. Before his suicide, Larry Roach had been severely injured on the job. Electric shock had left him physically and mentally disabled. He had seizures, was emotionally unstable, and when his wife left him, Larry Roach became despondent and took his own life. Today, near Dallas, Texas, in this quiet neighborhood, a new family lives in the house where Larry Roach committed suicide. It was supposed to be the Lamonis family's dream house. They finally had a backyard for the children and plenty of room. But their happiness has been short-lived. They believe something is trying to force them out. Three weeks after we moved in, strange things started to happen. I had walked from the dining room into the kitchen, and about then, something got a hold of my hair and lifted me up, and I started hollering, Pam, Pam, help me. And she turned around and looked, and she said I was just like a, a, a haze all over me, like a glow, like I had lit up. Most of the disturbances in the house seem to be related to strange electrical energy that had an almost human form. It affected appliances, the telephone, the lights. The phone answering machine played back messages spontaneously. Then a frightening apparition appeared in the kitchen. All at once I just felt like something was in the kitchen. I just felt like something was staring at me. And I turned around and I looked and I seen laying on the floor like a whole figure of a man's body. I was terrified. So I got up and when I did it just vanished away like it went up into the air and smoke up into the kitchen light. And the terror only worsened. It started getting worse and worse in the house. It got to where I was scared to stay here. Late at night, eerie footsteps would echo throughout the house. The apparition paced outside the bedroom doors. Then the activity in the house took a sinister turn. Did the apparition want the family dead? I came home one afternoon, and the gas stove had been turned on, and Joe was asleep on the sofa. I came in, smelled the gas at the front door, left the front door open because you could not even walk in and it really scared me. After this incident, Pam started to ask neighbors about the history of the house. I told Pam something has happened in this kitchen. And she said, well, Mother, I think you're right. So she went to investigate with her neighbors, and they did explain to her that a man had committed suicide in the kitchen. The Lamonises wondered if it was Larry Roach's angry, restless spirit that was tormenting their lives. Desperate to find out, Pam contacted psychics Dwana Paul and Carol Williams. When Pam called me, she was very disturbed. Her voice was shaking. She said, I have someone in my house, and it's, it's, it's a ghost. I did feel cold spots in a few of the rooms. And as we were just sitting there in, in the living room, living area, uh, I started feeling the tingling sensation that I feel when a spirit is there. Just before the 18th anniversary of the suicide, the psychics hold a seance they hope will drive Larry Roach's spirit from the house. Carol, Duana, and other psychics join together with the Lamonis family. We've come here tonight to bring in the spirit of Larry from this house. And we're going to attempt to send Larry to the light understand that you that you committed suicide you killed yourself I sh sh pull that trigger a rush of energy fills the room Pam feels something touching her he wants to touch my ear 
Larry, we, we know you're here. There's no reason for you to be in this house any longer. It's time for you to move into the other dimensions of light. You can no longer stay here. Move toward the light. It was a good seance. I could feel it. I could feel it when the chairs were shaking and everything. I knew it was here. But it didn't, did not leave. And I don't think it's going to ever leave this house because it kept saying over and over in my mind, this is my home, this is my home. To see if a spirit could be inhabiting the home, a sightings camera operator stays at the house alone. Okay, there's an awful lot of static electricity in the air right now. It seems to be coming from that tool shed. We found out later the tool shed was the last place Larry Roach was seen alive. The dog's barking at something. There's, there's nothing there. 3.30. I just felt something in the air around this area here, in this hall. Uh, the flashlight's going out. I don't understand because I, I just put batteries in it. The light in the kitchen's going on and off, but I'm not touching it. It's uh, 5 a.m. right now. There's, there's a weird smell. I, I don't know what it is. There's a lot of electricity in the air, more now than before. The warning light on the camera's on. Why are the batteries dying? Larry Roach seems to have made his presence felt, even to our crew member, and the Lamonises still fear the unearthly phenomena in their home. In the coming weeks, we'll return to Dallas for an update. Welcome to Sightings. I'm Tim White. We begin a new series of investigations tonight with a trip to Alcatraz. Since the world's most infamous prison was open to the public in 1973, some visitors claim to have felt the ghostly presence of long-dead inmates. Well, Park Service officials won't comment. So, along with the sightings investigative team, I went to Alcatraz. There's a strange pull you feel viewing this imposing outpost from shore. It was once the toughest prison in America, home to Al Capone, Machine Gun Kelly, and the Birdman of Alcatraz. It started in the 1850s as a military fortress defending San Francisco Bay. We're in the guardhouse built in 1857. It was intended to be used as a defensive point. There was a gun that would have been mounted here, but it got, never got used. Instead, this was turned into the first cell block on Alcatraz in 1863. Insubordinate soldiers were locked away in tiny cells, measuring only three by six feet. They were beaten, chained to the walls, and forced to endure hard labor on the rock. Alcatraz boomed. And by 1909, the cell house that dominates the top of the island had been built for the incarceration of military prisoners. Alcatraz remained a barbaric military prison until the 1930s, when social upheaval reached a peak and mobsters ruled the big city streets. The Justice Department requested that the military surrender the island, and Alcatraz was transformed into a maximum security prison, the last stop for America's most hardened criminals. The monsters of society were stored here until 1963, when the prison closed. Alcatraz was open to the public in 1973 and attracts 4,000 tourists a day. There are reports that Alcatraz is haunted. Could the pain and suffering endured by prisoners at Alcatraz still exist today in the form of ghosts? When you walk in, it's really dark and it's very cold in there and I got the chills and I had to leave. I didn't like it at all. Normally I don't <laughs> believe in ghosts, but in a place like that where there have been so many violent deaths and the kind of people that were there, you know, it's quite possible. I think uh, it, it's a natural idea that when you come onto the island, you're going to be experiencing something a little, a little special, you know, a little extra. Sounds of a cell door closing, uh, somebody appearing and then disappearing. Uh, those type of things would uh, uh, really send chills up your spine. Ray Polo, a former Park Service ranger on the island, claims many ghostly encounters have occurred. But for the past 19 years, the Park Service has refused to talk about reports that Alcatraz is haunted. Official policy about a ghost on Alcatraz is uh, we would say that, in, in effect, well, maybe things that happened, maybe they didn't. It's just something that... Uh, it wasn't uh, officially sanctioned. Are there ghosts on Alcatraz? We asked nationally renowned psychic investigator Peter James to spend a night on the rock. I walked with Peter as he tried to communicate with what he calls entities inside Alcatraz. 
As we walked through the cell blocks, Peter began to hear what he felt were the voices of tortured spirits. Law was mad. Alcatraz was a place that drove men mad. Military prison. That's a lie. They're in pain, and I'm in pain, and there's blood here. They couldn't break out of the prison. Like a psychic bloodhound, Peter was drawn to out-of-the-way places around the island. I know little or nothing about Alcatraz other than what I learned here during the past two days that I've been here. And my, my feelings are strongly that there is an energy here unlike ever, any, any other that I've ever experienced. Peter claimed to have little knowledge of the history of Alcatraz. He said he let the spirits guide him, and they led him here to an area known as the Citadel. This particular one, I feel there was a loss of life here. And this man was a sergeant. And this is, this is, an, this is an American life that was lost in this particular cell. And uh, I, I feel badly, I, I, I feel beaten. I, I don't feel that I, that I lost life from gunfire. I lost life because of neglect. I was neglected. I, I am responding to, there's a definite sense here that I'm hungry, I'm thirsty. There could not be any crime in the world worth the punishment that I feel this entity endured. Peter had correctly identified the dank dungeon where military prisoners were kept. The specific ghost images he felt were later substantiated by our experts. I'm feeling an American here. I'm feeling an American serviceman right here. Men were kept chained down there, um, sometimes chained through iron rings to the floor, other times, as we understand, chained with iron rings in the ceiling. Something is, like, going through my stomach. It feels like something metal, and my legs are in chains as well. And I'm feeling that if I stay here much longer, that I'll die. Peter's feelings of death and torment followed us through the night. At daybreak, we replayed Peter's observations for our experts, like ex-guard Al Bloomquist. And after each of Peter's encounters, our experts confirmed the accuracy of his psychic visions. Forced to comply with these orders that I'm, that I'm being given, and I feel like I'm being trapped here in this particular um, um, area. We were told there's trouble on the rock. On May the 2nd, 1946, six inmates with other lesser accomplices decided to blast their way out of the prison. I feel like I'm being thrown into this cell and I'm being thrown into that cell. During that time, they gathered up nine officers, put them inside of cells to be used as hostages. Who are the people in here? Four or five? Are they prisoners? Uh, I, no, I am a person of authority. I, I feel like I should be on the other side of this of, of, of the bars, but I'm here against my will. I am I am I am here by I am placed here by force, and and at the point of a gun. Who's you know, holding it? Who's shooting? Um, <clears throat> I, I, I feel um, there is there is uh, there is a jo that, that Joseph is involved here. Joseph Kretzer, he was one of the toughest of the bunch. He was really a mean dog. What well, does Joseph have to do with this? Joseph is keeping me captive here. Joseph is placing me here against my will. Where's Joseph? Bill Kretzer took the 45 automatic and started shooting these officers, innocent officers, inside the cell. I'm sensing that I, Bill, or William, uh, lost his life here. Only one. Only one. Four or five here. One, there are one four there. here, but, but others are wounded. But I only feel one loss of life in this particular uh, place. Whose voice are you hearing? I'm, I'm, I'm hearing William. There's a Bill or William. William Miller later died in the hospital in San Francisco. Other officers were very seriously wounded. The name starts with a C. Cecil Corwin had his lower jaw torn away. It's a wonder they weren't all, all killed in the spot. Alarms sounded. Military reinforcements arrived. The inmates fled to a utility corridor in C Block. 46 years later, Peter James led our cameras to the same, now dark, corridor. 
Peter, you've sensed a lot in there. Yes. Why, why don't you take, we have an infrared lens on the camera, why don't you go in there with the camera and see what you can do on I would, I would, I would like that. I would like that. Uh, Joseph? <coughs> I'm coming through. Mark, Mark, Mart, Marty, Marty, Mark. Give me a better, give me a better verification of a name. Marv, Marvin, Marvin, is that Marvin? Marvin Hubbard died in the utility quarter of C Block. Oh, there's a, I, I am responding to a sensation here and I feel like I'm losing consciousness and what uh, Joseph is telling me is that he's been shot. Joseph Dutch Kretzer died in the utility corridor at C Block. Oh, it's cold. It's freezing back here. There's a cold spot here. And, oh, yes. Hello? There is a third soul here with the letter B. Bernard Paul Coy died in the utility corridor of C Block. Listen, they're moaning, moaning. The pain is so intense. They're, they're like little boys back here. They're, they're, they're moaning, all, almost asking for the guidance of their parents right now. There are at least a hundred ghosts here, a hundred entities that walk these corridors, looking for a way out, looking for that life force that they seem to have lost somewhere, tragically. I can't really say that I'm a believer myself, but uh, like many people, I guess, there are some things that just simply are unexplained. After my night on Alcatraz, it was hard to ignore the images and voices evoked by Peter James, but I still have questions about what we experienced together. Joining me now from Los Angeles is psychic Peter James. Peter, good of you to join us. Thank you, Sam. Nice to have you here. We were together there that evening, and people who see the tape might wonder, is this guy for real? I don't believe it. It looks like he was making it up. He probably memorized a book. He talked to the guards. He went there half a dozen times. How do you answer that? I had no prior knowledge other than what the general public knows about Alcatraz. We were there together. I tried to be as open as I could through those hours. And as I told you at the time, I didn't hear the voices. I didn't see anything. I didn't sense what you sensed. Does that say something about me or about you, the differences between us, or does it say something about the entities? They don't choose to speak to you. It says something about all of us, Tim, in that we all spend too much time in trying to disprove that there is another side rather than to simply bridge those gaps of ignorance, as I put it. And yes, some of us are more acutely sensitive as I am. Can you turn it on and off, Peter, or are you seeing and hearing things all the time? I see things all the time. I, I don't know that you can, but I am able to turn it off and on, yes. Peter James, thank you. Thank you for having me. And we will be back with more sightings in just a moment. Coming up next, in a special sightings update from Wisconsin, this man captured a bizarre image with his Polaroid camera that many believe is a ghostly apparition. According to the most recent Roper poll on the paranormal, 18 and a half million Americans report having seen a ghost. One of those people contacted us with a remarkable photograph that he took near his home in Hayward, Wisconsin. Northern Wisconsin is a freshwater fishing paradise, and some say a haven for ghostly apparitions. Skeptics dismiss these stories as folklore designed to lure tourists. But eyewitness accounts are plentiful, and now potential hard evidence has surfaced, an intriguing photograph. I looked up, and here I see this white figure above the tree line, and it's slowly descending towards the trees. Al Denninger has been a fishing guide through the waters of the Chippewa Flowage for 17 years. He knows these waters like the back of his hand. But last October, he saw something he couldn't explain. You could see it actually pass through the trees and slowly descend right above the shoreline. And the object was uh, 10, 12 feet tall. I took one picture of the, with the Polaroid. Slowly, this object moved down the shoreline that way, towards the, maybe about towards the west. Moved about 50 yards, stayed there maybe 10, 15 seconds, and slowly ascended right straight up into the sky and was gone. Denninger claims he photographed this apparition of a human form floating above an area locals call Ghost Island. Later, he had his photograph enlarged for better analysis. I had the original looked at by a photo expert. 
says, first of all, you can't dupe up a Polaroid. He says, well, I can't tell you what it is, but whatever it is, it's really there. When word of Denninger's photo got out, more eyewitnesses came forward, claiming they'd also seen the apparition. Two young men were fishing there at midnight, and one of them saw a white-robed figure about eight feet from the ground, sort of floating among the graves. Al sent them the picture, and they called up and says, that is what we saw. Stories of discontented spirits haunting Ghost Island have existed since Wisconsin's Chippewa River was dammed in the 1920s, causing floodwaters to engulf the island's historic cemetery. Most of the graves were moved to higher ground, but locals worry about the plots that were left behind. Could the apparitions be restless souls searching for their displaced loved ones? I've always had an open mind, and I've always figured that uh, you're a little naive to think you're probably the only one in this universe, but uh, whatever I saw, it definitely wasn't from anything I've ever seen before. If you photographed or videotaped what you believe to be a ghost, or if you had an encounter with the paranormal, our sightings investigative team wants to know. Coming up next, a sinister entity has haunted this family for years. I opened my eyes and it was a thing that was standing over me. Our investigation, next. Since 1978, Robert and Reba Malone and their four children have lived with frightening and confusing events that make them believe the family is haunted by demonic entities. They claim the hauntings began 14 years ago, the day their daughter Nikki was born. Is there a connection? The Malones believe there is, but others in their small Georgia community aren't convinced. Carrollton, Georgia is home to at least one family who believes they're haunted and their strange plight has become the subject of radio talk shows in the area. So let's go to the phone lines and welcome to Afternoon Talk. Well, I'm not one of your people that go to talk about a ghost. You're not? Nope. Horace, what do you think about that whole situation? A ghost? Yes. I don't more believe it than I, if I had a hole in my head. On the rural farms just outside of town, in Carrollton's quiet neighborhoods, and on Main Street at the Pity Pat Cafe, discussion about ghosts and the unfortunate Malone family is unavoidable. I've never met, uh, met any yet, but I believe in them. I don't believe in ghosts. I haven't never seen one, and I don't believe nothing I don't see. I think that the majority of the people believe in ghosts, but they won't admit it. Whether or not the townspeople here believe in ghosts, they do admit that the Malone family is running scared. The children race home before dark, where they stand guard against what they believe are demons. Since the Malones moved to this Carrollton home two years ago, things haven't improved. They fear any home they live in will become a battleground for something bizarre, something evil. I definitely think it's the devil. I feel like that I can't protect my children from it. It's after to kill one of us in the family, all of us. I've wondered a lot of times if this uh, evil spirit was working through our sick child, our sick daughter. Sometimes people turn to paranormal explanations because there is an explanation that they don't want to face. They claim the terror started the day their youngest daughter was born, but that it's unrelated to her medical condition. The family believes her brain damage, asthma, and kidney transplant have nothing to do with the evil force that plagues them daily. It's attacked my brother at one time. It's had him up against the wall, choking him. He was swinging in midair. No, nothing was there. There was no arms, nothing. Where is it at? You can't see it. I opened my eyes, and it was this thing that was standing over me. It was real big, and it was black. I couldn't move. I woke up, and I saw uh, something walking through the hall. It looked like it didn't have no head over there. All these people can't be seeing and hearing the same thing, so therefore it's not imagination. It can't be. Part of the motive of the family is to hang together, and since their motive is to hang together, they would not necessarily say, oh, don't believe that, that's not likely, because that, in a certain sense, might threaten the togetherness, the sense of togetherness of the family. Anybody that would experience it would know that it's real. The Malone's daughter-in-law has recorded each paranormal encounter in her diary. Her entries tell the story of a family in crisis, enjoying short-lived periods of serenity, followed by days, weeks, even months of terror. The family in Georgia is being plagued by inhuman evil spirits that are affecting their lives on every possible level. They have fled from house to house 
to try to escape this evil, but you cannot escape it. It must be dealt with, it must be documented, and it must be gotten rid of through spiritual means. In 1990, the Malones contacted Ed and Lorraine Warren, world-renowned for their work with victims of what they feel is demon possession. First, they studied the family's claims and their psychiatric history. Only then did the Warrens agree to conduct a face-to-face -face investigation. A figure, a dark black figure, about, about four feet. I saw balls of light continuously, probably the size of a tennis ball. I had heard wrappings there, wrappings right underneath my feet. This audio cassette is the only record of the night the Warrens were working with the Malones and claim a jar of pennies levitated and smashed into a researcher and then a family member. The martyrs and the saints command you. Reveal your identity. Give us a sign that you want the Malones out of this house. Whoa! 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 The pennies picked themselves up, jar and all had to move out of the room, come through the door. It first clipped Joe hard on the shoulder and then went and got the sun right in the face. And I was, I mean, just terrified. And I ran out of the house. I was crying, my nose was bleeding. Yeah. It was so heavy and so humid that night. And yet, as soon as you started to provoke in that house, we were getting that psychic call, and it was coming like in waves, like as if there was a fan blowing from a freezer. I could feel it on my ankles first. It was true psychic cold. The women were shouting, and, and it was everybody was running around confused. Eventually, the phenomena ebbed, and uh, things calmed down, but everybody slept in the living room that night. No, I'm not crazy. No, I'm not on drugs. No, I don't drink, period. It's not a fraud, it's not a hoax, it's not a psychologically disturbed family. You want to call it devil's demons? I don't care. But there are things surrounding this family that are so terrifying that the average person looking at us right now could not in any way accept unless they were there and living it. After the Warrens' first visit, family life seemed to return to normal. But those were rare moments of peace. Soon, the hauntings returned and then got worse. Desperate for relief from their nightmare, the Malones turned again to the Warrens. And this time, the Warrens asked sightings to document their work with the Malone family. What else happened that was unnatural? Lights were, had started appearing in the living room. And my wife, she screamed. And she had got something and bit her on, uh, on the neck. Could you, take, could you describe that bite to us? I just felt it bite down, you know, and I slapped my hand over it. But there was nothing there? And, no. Was it when an I insect? Broke down, then I had slime, slime all over my hand. Can I ask you something? How old was Nikki when she was baptized? Uh, she, She's never been She had been baptized. She's been baptized now, though. No. Not yet? Not being baptized. Leaves her aura is wide open. Leaves her when a person open. becomes baptized, that closes up all the chinks in that supernatural glow that we call an aura, and evil can't penetrate it. The Warrens believe that baptizing the Malone's 14-year-old daughter was essential. As a prelude to that baptism, a priest was called in to bless the family. ...of this house and its occupants and possessions, that you may bless and sanctify them. If you can't feel the, the, the exertion of the powers of evil, you'd be insensitive, because these are miracles in reverse. It's not the most responsible thing to come to a family, uh, perform some kind of quick religious ritual, and then tell them that everything's going to be okay. I don't think that uh, human life is that simple. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 And it's the sign of the Jesus' holy cross on your forehead, love. Amen. This time, the Malones are once again filled with hope for the future, free from the hauntings of their past. But the lasting effectiveness of Father Regan's blessing and the baptism is still unknown. The Malones hope that the evil, whatever it was, has passed and their nightmare is finally over. The Malones might have been helped by other types of therapy, counseling or prayer, but they chose the method that they felt would be best for their family. 
you or I might not choose the same course, but how to cope with serious family problems is a very personal and individual decision. Coming up, a sightings viewer asks us to investigate a sinister entity that haunts her family's home. My little girl's hysterical and I can't do anything. Recently, one of our viewers called to tell us that she believes her home and family are haunted and has asked sightings to conduct a ghost investigation. Well, we thought this would be a good opportunity to show you step by step how a real ghost investigation is conducted. I went to her home in Garden Grove, California to begin the investigation process. My little girl's hysterical and I can't do anything. I feel so weak, so helpless, and I don't know what to do. Soon after Anita Mock and her family moved into this Garden Grove, California home, the haunting phenomena began. At first, the family claimed the ghostly activity was benign. Objects would appear and disappear without warning. But in the past few weeks, the haunting has taken a frightening turn. When I saw that that night, I just, I dropped the dishes that I was holding and I grabbed my little sister and I ran outside and I just went hysterical. I turned around, I looked at her and I just got up and started running. We both jump because we're just, we're ready for anything at that moment. We're just so scared. The family has seen a spectral figure dressed in white moving through the house. Doors slam for no reason. Lights go on and off. And as Anita told me, something is now physically harming her children. Three-year-old sleeps. Right here. And I came in and I asked her, what's wrong? She just sat up and she was just shaking. And she just started crying. And I just kept telling her, what's wrong? Did you have a bad dream? So no, no, no. Bad man walked from Hall, came in here, and gave me an ouchie, you know. What, what, do you, what did she mean, gave her, her an ouchie? That meant to her that he hurt her. No physical effects could be seen after the daughter's frightening experience, but psychologically, the haunting has certainly affected everyone. Tell us what happened on that night when you saw something in the kitchen. It looked like something was staring at me. And all well, I noticed, what did you see? Something I noticed what? something was, it was wearing white and it was peeking around the door and it had like its hands on the door. She grabbed my daughter because she was afraid to look up at her. Right. She was afraid, because it, it looked solid. She was afraid it was going to come out and get her. And I ran out. I went out in the backyard and Anita was out there and I just, I started crying and I couldn't stop crying. In desperation, the family asked a Catholic priest to bless the home in hopes that it would drive away the entity. But it's still here, and I don't know what to do. I mean, what do you do in a situation like this when a little girl is scared to death and you can't comfort her? I don't know what to do. We've asked Lloyd Auerbach, the director of the OPI, the Office of Paranormal Investigations, to conduct this ghost investigation for us. Lloyd Arbach, welcome to Sightings. Thank you, Tim. It's good to be here. Typically, what would be your first step in an investigation? The first step in any investigation is always going to be witness interviews. And we'll try to do other things, such as go through the house, um, this is, which is very typical, with a map, a floor plan of the house, and try to pin down where things have gone on within the house, usually with a couple of the witnesses. And we also walk through with our tri-field meters, which measure magnetic fields, among other things, to try to determine if there's any sort of uh, correlation. Do you have any hunches, Lloyd, about what might be causing a haunting phenomenon in this case, if there is one? My hunch is this is probably a poltergeist case where we might have some things being moved around by someone or the whole family using mind over banner ability and there might be an overtone of an apparition. That has happened in a number of cases where literally some suggestion that there might be a ghost there has caused people to see it. Lloyd, what is it that interests you about this particular case? Probably the most interesting thing about this case is that it is a mixed bag, that we have physical object movement plus we have an apparition being sighted. With very rare exceptions, most of the apparition cases where people see a ghost or hear voices that seem to be fairly intelligent um, that we call apparitions or ghosts, those cases don't also involve uh, physical object movement. So this is kind of interesting from the point that it might be both. Uh, it could be an apparition moving things around, it could be a poltergeist, or it could be a lot of things that are misinterpreted by the family and there could be nothing paranormal going on. Lloyd, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Tim. In the coming weeks, we'll bring you updates on Lloyd's progress as he conducts this ghost investigation. But first, sightings travels to Stirling Castle, Scotland's reputed house of horror. This Scottish castle is rumored to be the most haunted place on earth. It's a fitting beginning, since the origins of Halloween can be traced back to Scotland.
in the third century. Scotland, Ireland, and Great Britain were home to the Druids, an ancient people who began the celebration of the holiday we now call Halloween. The Druids believed that Halloween, actually New Year's Eve by their calendar, was the one night of the year when spirits, both good and evil, were allowed to roam the earth. You're at wandering around on the night on Halloween when the dead are coming back from the grave. You don't want them to recognize you because they might do something to you or they might take you back with them. Good spirits were welcomed into Druid homes with treats. The evil spirits were on fires and frightening masks. Later, jack-o'-lanterns were used to keep away evil spirits, but these talismans aren't always successful. At Stirling Castle in Scotland, more than a thousand people a year report seeing and feeling evil spirits, and not just on Halloween. In fact, since Stirling Castle was first built to defend the Scottish countryside in the 15th century, countless eyewitnesses have reported seeing ghosts, evil spirits, poltergeists, and demons. I saw a shadow. No face, just a dark shadow in the corner. When I look back again, there was absolutely nothing. I've been walking around there at night, and I felt a presence. I felt someone behind me. Wasn't exactly on the ground. She was kind of floating, but she had a face away from me. It definitely was a woman. Very scary. Makes you cold. I know what I saw. The best known ghost in Stirling Castle is the Green Lady and uh, she is said to be the spirit of um, a servant maid who saved Mary Queen of Scots from death in 1661 when her bed, the bed curtains uh, caught fire um, from a naked flame, a candle held beside the bed. Um, her spirit is said still to haunt Stirling Castle today. What we saw just at the corner of the graveyard up at the foot of the castle wall was a green, a lady dressed in green. It seemed to be glowing. There were seven or eight of us ran up to see what was going on. I mean, covering 25 yards, there was nobody in either direction. I can't think of any other castle who actually has a photograph of one of the ghosts. And we have a photograph of a Highlander here, marching out of the castle. And you can see straight through him as he comes underneath the archway. We sent the, uh, the photograph away and it was tested and it wasn't a double negative. It hadn't been uh, superimposed on top of it or anything. So that's why we believe it was uh, actually a picture of the ghost. Trying to make contact with ghosts at a site such as Stirling Castle can be approached in several different ways by both scientists and spiritualists. We brought two separate investigative teams to Stirling, each operating independently, but both with the same end in mind, tangible evidence of at least some of the 100 ghosts rumored to live here. Internationally respected psychical researcher Tony Cornell came to Stirling from Cambridge, searching for scientific evidence. One thing about the whole psychic field is it's full of contradictions. You can go to one case and say, oh, this is absolute rubbish. This is imagination. This is nonsense. You go to another one and you get a pearl of information. You say, well, we can't ignore this. So I should think, really, I'd say there are such things as ghosts. I've never seen one. I'd very much like to see one. Perhaps I might see one tonight. You never know. Tony Cornell asked London's premier spiritualist medium, Glyn Edwards, to help him choose a good location for an overnight surveillance. There's something here. There's definitely something here. Here? What about over here? Not so much here. Not so much here. When we go out on an investigation, uh, the kind of equipment we're taking is purely simply to confirm the physical presence of it. Um, is it in the mind of the person, or is it a real physical object? So what we do is we take equipment that will record any changes in the physical environment. Sound, sight, heat, geomagnetic changes, uh, any, uh, any form of electrical change, because we don't know what makes these things occur. So we want to know if we leave this stuff behind, do ghosts then appear, or do they only appear because there's a human being there? Well, this is the kind of thing we want to confirm with the instrumentation. Cornell set up an infrared camera and a standard video camera to be left on all night. The next day, the video revealed nothing extraordinary, but the audio portion was startling.
No one was in the castle. The lone night watchman was far from the recording site. The nearest road was more than a mile away. Listen again for what sounds like moaning and screaming among the electronic static. Could these be the ghostly voices of Stirling Castle's tortured dead? Two days after the haunting sounds were recorded, sightings brought in a second team, comprised of psychics and headed by paranormal researcher Malcolm Robinson. They hoped to find additional evidence of ghost activity. Their investigation took place near the recording site in the castle's old prison, called the Toll Booth. We go along and investigate these cases, speak with the people involved to ascertain um, if indeed there are something of a psychic nature happening. This group of psychic investigators uses a controversial and often dangerous technique called spirit rescue. In a rescue, the psychics attempt to become temporarily possessed by any spirits that may be present. They believe the tortured spirits inside them can then be released into another dimension. On this night, world-renowned psychic Rosemary Todlin claimed one ancient tortured spirit had entered her body. They were attacking me. They were bringing me back. They were attacking me. They were bringing me back. Rosemary appeared to be speaking as a centuries-old prisoner who had been tortured in Stirling Castle. While she was in her trance, other psychics attempted to liberate the supposed spirit from her and rid it from the castle. <laughs> You might never get another chance. This is your chance. This is your chance. This is your chance to be free once and for all. Spit it out if you have to. This is where you take that step through the door, a bigger door beyond even that, a much greater door filled with light. That I actually felt escape. I felt it physically and I felt it emotionally. And the pressure began to just evaporate from me. Do you feel that the spirit has been released then from this room? He's no longer here as far as I'm concerned. So you're I quite actually... sure of this? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He wanted out and he got an out. He got that door that he wanted. Yeah. And there's no way to come back here. Yeah. We know there were torture chambers in the tall booth. And indeed, if they followed the practice of the country at that particular time, and indeed over many, many years, then there's no doubt there were thumb screws and practices within that toll booth to force confessions from the unfortunate inhabitants. I think what we've had here is a little bit dubious. I mean, I get the feeling of, no, it's, it's too melodramatic. Sincere, yes, but I don't think it was correct. But that's not saying that there aren't things in Stirling Castle. Of course there are, because many sane and sensible people have walked around and seen these things. There may be conflicting views on the merits of spirit rescue, but Malcolm Robinson and his team of psychics believe that there is now one less ghost in Stirling Castle, that they have relieved the suffering of one tortured spirit in Scotland's House of Horrors. Ten Bells is a pub in Whitechapel at the east end of London. Haunting phenomena have been reported there for the past hundred years. Well, during our own investigation at the Ten Bells, we uncovered evidence that the paranormal activity there may very well be related to a notorious murderer who has never been found. The Ten Bells has been a favorite meeting place in London's Whitechapel district since 1754. And for the past 100 years, it has also been a favorite haunt for ghostly apparitions spotted by owners and customers alike. It was just something I couldn't explain, but it was frightening. Haunting is a form of communication. We first brought our investigation into the pub's dank cellar, where many people have experienced haunting phenomena and apparitions. Sightings asked renowned psychic investigator Marion Dampier-Jeans to record her impressions at the Ten Bells. It's quite, if you like, a bit of a tragic sort of place, but spirit are definitely in here. This is the door that we where you can hear banging during the night and you kind of get a, a funny kind of feeling or presence. And I know that Spirit have showed himself to landlords who's been here. On a number of occasions we heard footsteps. We come upstairs here and we find nothing. And I just feel totally, completely distant. The whole atmosphere here is, is very different. It's very disturbing, if you like. About five months ago, I, I was here managing the bar 
Um, after about eight or nine days here, I went down to the cellar. When I got down to the bottom of the stairs, I went over to the right. Very briefly, I got a glimpse of a woman in sort of old-style clothes. I think she comes to what is known as the old grounds, where she might have um, been, where she might have existed. It gave me just as much a fright, you know, really frightened, I've got to be honest. I would say she's from about 18... 56, 18, something, 60, whatever. It's around that era I'm in. She's been spotted downstairs on numerous occasions by previous managers. I still feel that there was a murder committed, but again, you know, I'm not quite sure who did the murder or why the murder was taking shape or place. This place was used to be frequently used by the ladies of the night going back to Jack the Ripper's time. Young lady, five foot two tall, she said lips. It's been proved that Elizabeth Stride did drink here. Marion had provided an important clue to the identity of at least one apparition, the name Liz. And indeed, Elizabeth Stride, a prostitute, was a frequent customer here in the late 1800s. On September the 30th, 1888, Stride, known as Long Liz, was the third victim of Jack the Ripper. Could it be her restless spirit that haunts the Ten Bells today? Our psychic investigator believes so, but we also called in scientific investigator Tony Cornell for his opinion. I mean, people in poltergeist cases and hauntings, they see things and hear things. Now, that's okay for them. It's, it, it's, it's real to them. But for us, for it to be real to us, we want it on film. We set out to try to film the haunting phenomena, but our camera operator was stymied. As we came into this little room we are in now, the recording fault in the viewfinder was going berserk, is the best way to describe it. And so we've now come in here again to play it back, and we just start it up. And yes, it's still showing strangely in the viewfinder. Psychic investigator Nella Jones has worked with Scotland Yard on a number of cases. We asked her to walk through Whitechapel to see if she felt a psychic connection between the hauntings and Jack the Ripper. We also brought in Don Rumbolo, Ripper historian and the owner of one of the alleged murder weapons. I'm pleased to have possession of it, but I don't know about proud. Um, I mean, it's such a, a macabre weapon. This is definitely the place. I would stake my reputation on that. It has a thumb grip on the blade uh, for cutting upwards. This is how you can tell that it's different from other knives of the period. Well, if Nella felt something here, there's a very good reason for it, because this is where the body of the first of Jack the Ripper's victims was found on the night of the 31st of August, 1888. Claiming no knowledge of where the murders had occurred, Nella led us to this site, but would not work with Rumbelow's knife. Take it back, please. I don't want to know. I don't want to know about that. If they could feel what I feel when I touch that, they wouldn't even want to look at it. Documents. Uh, letters of the time, contemporary memoirs. This is evidence. Um, using, uh, with due respect to Nella, using uh, um, a psychic is not proof. What's new in this case is really what's old. It was author and historian Paul Begg who was finally able to shed some new light on this dark subject. 30th of September, 1888, was the night of the double event when Jack the Ripper killed two women within an hour. The first of those murders took place along this street. In fact, a street not far from the Ten Bells pub. It's an interesting case because it's the one instance where we probably have a witness to Jack the Ripper in action. A man named Israel Schwartz was walking down the road. In front of him was another man, and ahead of both of them, standing in the entrance to a yard, was a woman. And as the second man approached, he attacked and assaulted the woman and threw her to the ground. Israel Schwartz probably saw Jack the Ripper committing his crime murdering Elizabeth Stride, who was found dead in the alleyway about 15 minutes later. Because there was a witness, the murder of Elizabeth Stride was key to Scotland Yard's investigation. The most important piece of information that's come to light in the last couple of years is what we call the Swanson Marginalia. And these notes were written by a man called Swanson who had overall responsibility for the investigation of the crimes. And in those penciled notes, he names Jack the Ripper. He says that the Ripper was a man called Kosminski. If the police at the time were right, and if we've understood the information that we've got correctly, Aaron Kosminski was Jack the Ripper.
Our ghost investigation at the Ten Bells, near the site of Elizabeth Stride's murder, poses intriguing new questions about the identity of Jack the Ripper. Foremost is the ghost of Long Liz trying to communicate some important clues. Is she trying to add her voice to those who believe Eric Kosminski is the bloody murderer known as Jack the Ripper? And if police believed Kosminski was the Ripper, why wasn't he arrested? Now, because Aaron Kosminski had never been tried, had never been convicted, they were not able to release that information to the public. And that's why this has always remained a mystery. While Eric Kosminski is considered a prime suspect, Scotland Yard still holds files on two additional men they believe could be the real Jack the Ripper. But will we ever know for sure? Some psychics answer yes and suggest we listen more carefully to the ghostly presence in London's East End. It is considered to be the most haunted place in Kentucky, a country music club called Music World that's been plagued by supernatural activity. Why Music World? Well, some believe it's because the club was built on a site where a gruesome murder occurred. And because the murder was rumored to be part of a satanic ritual, the area has been dubbed Hell's Gate. This building, on the site known as Hell's Gate, was built more than 100 years ago, and now houses Bobby Mackey's Music World, a country western bar and dance club in Wilder, Kentucky. The patrons here come for a good time, oblivious to the building's evil past. They do not know that once this was a slaughterhouse, and later, a place where, some say, satanic rituals and murder occurred. Satanic worshipers went there at night to worship and praise the devil due to the blood that was spilled there from the dead animals. Their blood was poured into a well. The well is known as Hell's Gate. The slaughterhouse, closed since 1938, and the bloody well, now sealed, are just two examples of the evil that has plagued this site since the 19th century. In 1896, a girl named Pearl Bryant was beheaded somewhere in that area. Two men, Alonzo Walling and Scott Jackson, were arrested for that crime. People still today talk about Alonzo Walling and Scott Jackson refusing to tell the whereabouts of Pearl's head while they had the nooses around their neck. The judge had offered them a life sentence opposed to death if they would tell the whereabouts of her head. They refused. The rumors that have abounded here for years is simply that these two men were satanic worshipers and her head was given as a sacrifice, a blood sacrifice to the devil. And they would rather die than suffer Satan's wrath. Newspaper accounts reveal that Pearl had been five months pregnant and that the father was one of her killers. Today, several witnesses claim that the headless woman and her two murderers still haunt Music World. I felt something was trying to get me out of here. And there was always a voice saying, get out, get out. Many, many people have sworn they've seen the form of a headless girl floating through the nightclub, moving through the crowd when the band's up on the stage playing. I came in here one night and when it was closing time and the jukebox was un unplugged, it was playing the anniversary waltz. I won't come in here uh, unless I have to by myself because uh, this is a, a, a very dark, eerie, weird feeling building. Sightings recently conducted a detailed investigation with paranormal experts Dr. William Roll and Dr. Dean Radin. They brought equipment designed to sense and measure the presence of abnormal energy at the site. It's not only uh, brains or minds that hold memories, uh, physical space also holds something like memories or traces. This is something that, that I don't think can be explained away in, in terms of simpler theories, can't be explained away in terms of magnetic fields or radiation. I think that it's something of a genuine parapsychological nature. Sightings also brought in noted psychic Echo Bodine who had no previous knowledge about Hell's Gate or Music World. As soon as she walked into the building, Echo had strong psychic impressions. There's a, a psychic image of a lot of blood in this room. A lot of blood, a lot of hatred. There's an image of a man and a woman downstairs. Again, a man with dark hair and a woman who's afraid. He knows what he's doing. He's been here long enough. The feeling is that he tries to scare people especially women, it seems like he, uh, he doesn't like women messing with his property. There's definitely an energy here that does not want me to do any of this, all right? I mean, it's really strong. When our experts sat down to compare notes with some of the witnesses at Music World, an alarming discovery was made. 
Pearl and her murderers may not be the only spirits haunting this establishment. Our team discovered that there are others who met with violent death here. There's been definitely violent death in this place and uh, sad death. I kept hearing voices crying about the broken dreams of this place. The psychic's impressions of broken dreams may refer to star-crossed lovers who reportedly met here in the 1930s. Their romance ended in tragedy, and some believe there is a link between their untimely death and the other apparitions that haunt Hell's Gate. After the property changing hands several times, the building became a gambling casino. There was a dance hall girl there named Johanna. She became pregnant by a man named Robert Randall, who was a singer at the club. Her father supposedly had Robert Randall killed. This was according to a diary that was found inside the nightclub. She consequently poisoned her father and herself and committed suicide inside the same nightclub. Johanna, according to the diary, was five months pregnant. Five months pregnant, just like Pearl Bryan, the first known victim of Hell's Gate. Then we discovered that the dead lovers of the 1930s had a link not only to the past, but to the present as well. There was an eerie connection between one of the lovers, Robert Randall, and current club owner, Bobby Mackey. I went to Bobby Mackey and discussed this with him. I learned that Bobby Mackey's original name was Randy. At one day old, his umbilical cord, where the doctor had severed it, had ruptured and he almost died. For some unknown reason, his mother changed his name to Robert Randall Mackey. Robert Randall, the same name as the singer. At first, Bobby Mackey ignored the story of the eerie similarity. I didn't want to hear it. And I told him, in fact, you know, to keep quiet about it. I didn't, didn't want it getting around because I had everything I owned stuck in here. And, uh, and I had to make a, a success of this some way or another. And then, uh, then my wife started, started bringing it up. Janet Mackey told her husband that she had just survived a terrifying encounter with an unknown force. She was five months pregnant at the time. Something had grabbed me around the waist. It seemed like it was trying to attack my child. Okay. And it picked me up and like threw me back down. Then when that happened, something grabbed my head. It was kind of forcing me down. I got away from him and when I got to the top of the stairs, there was pressure behind me pushing me down the steps. And when I looked back up, the voice was screaming, get out, get out. Janet's frightening paranormal encounter triggered an early labor, but miraculously, the baby survived. Considering the string of evil deeds connected to this site and the well that still lies buried beneath it, was Janet's experience a warning? Are the Mackeys the next link in a chain of tragedy at this site? With a thriving business and a healthy child, Bobby Mackey refuses to believe that his family is a target of Hell's Gate. I don't believe such things could happen. I've never experienced anything in this building that would make me believe there's a ghost. Bobby Mackey claims that he does not believe that Music World, or The Well, is haunted. But beginning in April of 1993, Mackey will fill in The Well, demolish Music World, and rebuild it on property that he's just purchased, property that's only 100 feet south of the original Music World site. Tonight, a special extended report on the most important ghost investigation ever conducted on sightings. For the first time ever, hard evidence has been found that could prove the existence of communication with spirits. This historic case began with a call to our sightings hotline. A viewer contacted us to say that he had captured ghostly communication on Polaroid instant film. These are the pictures that have astonished researchers and left photographic experts baffled. They contain messages and images that seem to indicate communication with spirits. At first, the photographs frightened me. You snap one of these things and when you start asking questions, it starts answering. I don't know how to explain how bizarre that feels. Never, ever have I come across anything like this at all before. From their hillside home in Los Angeles, John Huckard and John Matkowski called us about their photographs. It all started less than a year ago, when both men began to sense a strange presence. I'll be standing there, reading something at the desk or something, and I'll feel a hand come up and place it on my shoulder. 
And of course, I turn around to see who it is, and, it, and there's nobody there. And, and then I get a, you know, sort of a jolt of adrenaline or whatever. It makes me kind of nervous. Another thing I've seen in the last year is I've just seen this sort of free-floating shadow moving across the floor, or the desk, or the wall, or whatever. And when I see it, at first, I, you know, I think it's well. I'm not actually sure what it is, but it's just, it's moving very slow. And then when I try to mask out all the possibilities for what could be causing it there's nothing causing it the other thing that that i've seen that apparently i'm the only one who's seen this is uh, i've seen this old man um standing over near the couch i see him out of the corner of my eye and it's just there for a hardly tangible instant it's just there and then when you look and blink it's not there anymore i felt things like um sort of like a sunburn on my arms it's the only way i can explain it it was sort of like um a tingly like a sunburn, that's the only thing I can think of. And that's how I usually know that there's some kind of presence here or something. In an effort to document the shadowy presence, the two men started taking pictures, unsure if anything so intangible could be captured on film. I took the picture of the bathroom door over by the bathroom and got this really strange looking thing that was either scary or comical. The first images they captured had distinct eyes, mouth, and body. But then the pictures took an unexpected turn, and the results shocked everyone. They started receiving answers to specific questions. We asked him what his name was, just assuming that it's a presence. And we asked him his name, and he answered on the Polaroid. <laughs> he told us his name was Wright. And we were like, uh-huh, we still didn't believe it. So we just continued asking questions to the middle of the air in the living room, just to nothing. And we'd ask him if he was a good ghost or a bad ghost, you know, just really name questions to begin with. And uh, he answered, friend. Who or what was causing this communication? When contacted, Polaroid was at a loss to explain the phenomenon. So far, more than 100 photos have been taken. Early writing was in English, but more recent writing has been in Latin. We have asked him if he, if he died in this house, and his answer was in Latin. He answered that, um, among other things, he did die in his house. Once John Matkowski contacted us, we assembled a sightings investigative team to be led by Carrie Gaynor, noted UCLA parapsychologist, who has investigated more than 800 haunting cases in his 20 years of field work. Kerry Gaynor's famous photographic work in the notorious Entity case uniquely qualified him for this assignment. In my line of work, we spent a great deal of time waiting and watching and wondering and hoping. We don't experience phenomena very often. Uh, the people that live in the home are there all the time, and as a researcher, I just come in and leave. But when something happens, it's so exciting, it's so exhilarating, it's, it's a moment of uh, connectedness with something that's just mysterious, exciting, unknown. Kerry Gaynor began his survey using a magnetometer to measure the physical environment. The reason we're using a magnetometer is just to see if there are any changes in the environment, basically with the onset of the phenomena. So that's the intriguing thing, is to walk the house and get a reading on it, and then if something happens, to have the magnetometer out and see if there's any change in the reading during the phenomena itself. Since the ghostwriting first appeared, several of John's friends have also been able to capture messages on film. We asked them to participate in our investigation. Researchers carefully documented every step of the process. To minimize the possibility of a hoax, four cameras were on site. Sealed film, direct from Polaroid, was checked, rechecked, and logged. Marty Elkin was the first to get an answer. Are most spirits good spirits or bad spirits? 30 seconds later, this astonishing message appeared. There are numerous remedial lemurs. Do we have a Latin dictionary? Lemurs. Uh, in Roman mythology, the night walking spirits of the dead. Hello. <laughs> the nervous laughter masked the tension and excitement in the room. Since the supposed spirit seemed to want to communicate with Marty, she asked another question. Right, will you be with them for a long time? And as the film developed, another answer appeared in Latin. Marty, what are you thinking right now? How strange this is. <laughs> Translated, the message reads, 
All this is over now. Edson Williams, a special effects expert from the Brooks Institute of Photography in Santa Barbara, California, was on site to examine the photographs immediately. Uh, these were shots that were taken today. Uh, a few minutes ago, they were shot and came out of the Polaroid. I actually watched them eject out of the Polaroid. And now I'm in the process of evaluating them, trying to decide if they're actually uh, authentic or if they've been uh, manipulated. There was a moment there where I, you know, I thought, oh my God, there's, and I was in the Polaroid, which made it even spookier. I'm in the background of the Polaroid. So I have a, a picture of me with ghosts running across it. And I really kind of, it made, made me feel that there could be something in the house. Many control photographs were taken with no results. And then suddenly, another message. Add letter on. Rick, what did you ask? I asked, what did he think of this in comparison to when he was alive? What do you think of the technology and what's going on? No, it's not in the dictionary. Ah, ad literum. Okay, to the letter, exactly. You have to establish a chain of evidence. You have to be able to observe the phenomena from the beginning to the end. So we have to, we have to load the film. We have to show that it's a sealed pack. We have to show that it's, that it's our camera. We have to fire it. We have to control the film as it comes out. We have to establish a chain of evidence. And once we do that, I'll feel much more comfortable. When we return, our night-long investigation continues with more startling images and eerie messages. Then, our photo expert analyzes the pictures and tries to duplicate them. And later, a paranormal investigator attempts psychic contact with the ghost writer. Hard evidence is the ultimate goal for every ghost investigator. And the instant photographs in this case might be just the kind of proof investigators have been searching for since the earliest days of photography. Early camera technology was crude and hoaxes were commonplace. But with the publication of the famous Lincoln photograph, spirit photography began to be taken seriously. Significantly, virtually every example of ghosts on film has been exposed as fraudulent. Only now, has sightings been able to document what appears to be ghostly images on film in real time with witnesses present. Here you will see without editing the ghost writing phenomenon on film. First, a fresh sealed package of factory direct film is loaded into John's camera. This camera has been examined by photographic experts who found no obvious evidence of tampering. In this continuous action sequence, John Huckert poses a specific question. A picture is taken, and an answer to the question appears on film while the sightings cameras roll. Is he here because because you guys, or is he here because his home is? is yeah, he right. Are you here because of us, or are you here because of the house itself? <laughs> Pepper 45 seconds later, writing appears on the photograph. What does it say? Genius Loca. Oh, Graham. Who asked the question? Genius. John asked it. The other John took it. The question for this picture was, uh, are you here for John or the house? And the answer came out in Latin. We looked it up. And the answer is fairly intriguing. The exact translation is the guardian spirit of a man or place. Without any obvious signs of tampering, the sightings team had to ask, could this actually be a guardian spirit communicating from the grave? Or a hoax not yet solved? The camera and the exposed film were immediately sent to the Brooks Institute of Photography. Edson Williams, who had been on site during the investigation, developed one possible explanation. I scanned in the Polaroid at a high resolution using a digital scanner. When I scanned it in, I zoomed in on the image I noticed there would be individual hair fragments in the text. I increased the contrast and sharpness and edge sharpness of the image, and the hair is, became more apparent. It appears to me, under high magnification, that is, it's some kind of fiber, more than likely cotton. In his lab, Williams demonstrated for sightings how he believes the writing could have been created. The initial step was to shoot pulled cotton with a 4x5 camera using E6 film. The next step was to pre-expose the Polaroid film. I removed the cover sheet of the Polaroid pack and inserted the transparency with the text on it. Using a flash pack, I exposed the Polaroid with the text. I removed the transparency, reinserted the cover sheet, and loaded the film normally. 
Although Williams did create writing similar to that of the alleged ghostwriter, his elaborate process took over an hour to complete. It would be difficult to recreate the same process in the house with observers. It looks like cotton, but then again. Experts at the Polaroid Corporation in Waltham, Massachusetts, were at a loss to explain the ghostwriting phenomenon. I spoke with photo expert Howard Warzel. We have never encountered it, and we've been selling film for now 50 years um, to billions of customers, especially film that was even higher sensitivity than the uh, current color film. Uh, it could be what they're saying that it is. Uh, it's a possibility that somehow there's a, a field that they are capturing. Physically, I don't know how they could do that. The two individuals who brought the story to our attention say they didn't manipulate the film. The sightings people who have been there on site and watched what's happened say that they didn't manipulate the film. Does that put your skepticism at rest? It depends on if the, where the film pack came from that was loaded into the camera. If the film pack came out of a sealed box that, from Polaroid uh, that had not had the seal broken, then the answer is yes, that would eliminate my skepticism. That looks like a fresh we looks screened like a, fresh a tape pack. of the continuous action sequence inside the house, and Howard Warzel saw factory-sealed film inserted in the cameras. They're very accomplished if it's a hoax. If it's real, it's, uh, it's something I've never seen before. Just on a personal level, isn't there part of you that would really like there to be something unusual going on here? Well, oh, of course. I mean, it's the, that's the desire to find spirits or design things that we haven't been able to find. Uh, it would be a, uncovering of a whole new world to people if it were real. No way any of us can really know, I guess. This sort of has validated some of my beliefs that there is something on the other side, I guess is how you could say it. For parapsychologist Carrie Gaynor, the investigation will continue. The potential here is really unlimited. If, if, if they can write on Polaroid film while it's inside a camera, uh, what else can they do? I mean, what next? The, it's really, it reaches to the outer limits of our imagination. Joining us now is Kerry Gaynor with the outcome of his investigation. Kerry, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Is this case in any way like other cases that you've investigated? I personally have never come across anything like this in the 20 years that I've been doing research, and I'm quite familiar with the literature, and I've never seen anything like this in the literature either. Where does the investigation go from here? What more do you need to know to draw some conclusions? Well, what I would like to do is to continue to go back there and try to photograph this writing again and see if I can get it out of my camera with my film to make sure there's been no manipulation on the part of the people in the home. Is this in some way more persuasive or more puzzling for you than past so-called ghost phenomena with cameras? Well, it's very exciting because I was there when the pictures were taken and the writing came out, but because it's Polaroid film, it's very difficult to analyze it properly. There's no negative to study. Um, it would be very interesting to, to get this kind of writing on film with a negative. If it's not a hoax, what does it mean? Well, there are two possibilities if it's not a hoax. One is that this is mind-to-film communication, so that it's some kind of psychokinetic process. Their mind is impacting the film itself. The other possibility is that it's some kind of spirit communication, and, and, and that, of course, is the more interesting possibility, but both of them are very exciting to me. Carrie, did the, did the ghost writing change in any significant way over time? Well, luckily they had dated their pictures and when we laid them in chronological order, we could see a, a fairly definite pattern of some kind of growth or learning. The writing, the handwriting itself seemed to improve in some way, which I found very interesting. Kerry Gaynor, thanks for your investigative work in this case. When we return, a different kind of investigation when paranormal investigator Peter James records his psychic impressions at the Ghostwriter house. Coming up next, our exclusive sightings investigation continues when a paranormal expert attempts psychic contact with the Ghostwriter. In our search for all possible explanations for the ghostwriting phenomenon, we contacted Peter James, one of America's foremost psychics. You might remember Peter's astonishing work with sightings during our investigation at Alcatraz. Well, because of his startling communication with apparent spirits inside that haunted prison, we felt Peter could provide important insights into this case. Surprisingly, at first, he was skeptical. Peter has a long history of exploring and documenting cases of hauntings, apparitions, and spirits that are not easily explained or understood. 
but he also has been involved in cases he has exposed as obvious fraud. In all of my years of delving into the paranormal world, I have never seen an entity present itself in that fashion. But I will say that all things are possible, and perhaps this is something new that I have never encountered. Peter James works by reading the vibrations he claims to feel when he is in the presence of spirits. I feel that this area here is um, within the bedroom is, is a hot spot. Or perhaps this is where um, the, the individual died in this particular area because this is where I feel it uh, strongest. Not only did he feel a presence, but within minutes, Peter said he was receiving several names telepathically. I received the name of Gilbert. I get, uh, there is a John, there is a Stefan or Stephen, um, there is a Robert, but two most prevalent names, I say three, is Ramon in, or Raymond in the bedroom and Evelyn uh, who is here and Amelia is throughout. Um, and I am getting an essence of all three of those names vibrationally. John Huckert and John Matkowski had already researched the names of the home's previous owners. Although they had not shared this information with Peter James, he had correctly named several people on their list. Now, uh, this is a list of the people who have uh, owned the house since uh, all, all the way back to 1848 when we, there wasn't even a house here. And going over the list, um, we see in 1911 and 1912, three women lived here. One of them was named Amelia. Huh. In 1941, someone named Robert was here. In 66, someone named Gilbert uh, owned this property. Having successfully identified three potential spirits inside the house, Peter found what he called a spiritual vortex, a kind of doorway through which spirits might be entering the house. I feel a, a very strong vibration, like something is definitely coming up from, from the floor and wants to come up to the ceiling. And uh, I got that tingling uh, sensation uh, right now. And it's also very cold here. It's almost like one would stand on a foot massager and feel the energy coming in from your feet, through your feet, from the floor. I'm feeling that vibrational feeling like something's coming. And, and if you look at my legs, they're, they're actually trembling. And it feels like something is coming from, from below and, and it's going through my entire body. Polaroid pictures of Peter James standing in the vortex also contain strange images. Feels like something could literally come from below and come through the floor. And it feels like something is beginning to surface. So whatever is on the Polaroids, it is their way of saying, uh, pay attention, this is how we're communicating with you. But they can't quite get it into um, words. Peter James felt strong, unsettling psychic vibrations during his entire stay in the house. And the pictures taken of him did seem to show evidence of the ghostwriting phenomenon. My experience here today clearly is, is telling me to convey to you that your uh, probing here should be ongoing. During his investigation, Peter James felt that the physical body of the ghostwriter could be buried on the property. In a bizarre quest for an explanation to the ghostwriting phenomenon, John Huckert and John Matkowski are now digging up their property in search of human remains. We'll keep you updated on their findings. Researchers who investigate sightings of ghosts and apparitions often find that the site of the haunting has a mysterious, sometimes brutal, past. When one of our viewers called to report bizarre ghost activity in her house, our first step was to look into the history of the house, and we did find that it had been a place of misery and torment. The evil began in 1984 in a small town in central Maryland. It's the kind of town that seems to promise the American dream. But two brothers were living a nightmare in one house in this quiet town. For a long time, it was their secret. But the day the boys, age four and six, told their mother, 
she told the police. What happened in this house to those two children uh, is an absolute nightmare. The children were raped and molested repeatedly. They weren't safe uh, because of the danger that lived within, and that danger lied uh, in, in their own father. He was convicted of sexual child abuse, but the boys insisted they were not the only victims. They described the brutal rape and murder of an infant. I don't think it's far-fetched to believe that a baby could be uh, stabbed repeatedly, uh, dismembered, and then decapitated, and then uh, literally tossed into a creek. And of course, that's what we believe happened in this particular circumstance. The police found no proof of murder. The father served just 18 months in prison. The house, with its monstrous memories, was sold to another family. Just six weeks after moving in, the new owner died suddenly, leaving his wife and three daughters alone in a house they now believe is haunted by an entity they call the Beast. This Beast has molested, raped, choked. He's touched, he's punched, he's scratched, and I just feel like it's getting stronger. The first time something had happened to me, I was laying in my bed, and I woke up for no reason, and I heard this breathing and I could feel it in my ear. It was like <sighs> he said in a real deep voice, he was like, make love to me. It was pinching my breast very hard and it just squeezed me on my behind. It was like I was being sexually assaulted by it. Like it was taking itself and entering into my body. The family fled the house and called sightings for help. They sent this video, a record of the night the so-called beast scratched the 13-year-old daughter. First it scratched me on this side of my face, and it hurt to bad. Then it scratched me on this side of my face, and it actually broke the skin down here, and it was bleeding. And I was just crying hysterical, and it was saying, your family can pay its respects now because you're mine. And it was saying, you can run, but you can't hide. The family refused to return to the house alone. Sightings agreed to send a team of ghost experts from the Office of Scientific Investigation and Research. When we go into a home to investigate, we look at, first and foremost, the environmental factors that are contributing to the situation. We look at the physiological elements, and we look at the psychological elements of all those in the family. Specialists descended on the house, armed with technology. Their aim was to electronically document any appearance by the supposed beast. We call it a beast because of the size of it. I remember I looked up and I could see it and it was, it was just huge. I was not imagining it, I was not sleeping. It was very, very real to me. And then I felt the tongue, there was a very pointed tongue. The thing pushed me back on the bed. And when it did, I felt this extreme weight on me. It started screaming at me, very raspy, very deep voice, and it was like, whoa, 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 and it just kept doing it and doing it. And of course, at this point, I'm screaming. I was laying in the bed next to her, and her body, it was like her heels were on the bed, and her head and shoulders were on the bed, but the rest of her body was arched up like a bridge. I know without a doubt that it was trying to have sex with me, and it was trying to rape me, and I was just powerless. There was just nothing I could do. It is terrifying. It's not something to sit around the kitchen table and say, oh, ha-ha, the ghost was calling my name last night, or the ghost wanted to have sex with me last night. Isn't that funny? It's not funny at all. Because of the women's terror, we had a security firm install 24-hour surveillance cameras throughout the house. Investigative devices were also put in place for the night-long vigil. The team prepared to monitor the environment, radioactivity, changes in light and electromagnetism, and the temperature, sound frequencies, and gravitational forces within the house. The neighborhood was also scoured for evidence of unusual levels of pollution or energy from power lines, something to scientifically explain the phenomenon that plagues this family. I've seen a tall man very skinny, long arms. It was just like a flash of light, and it was so fast, and it just, it was at the end of the bed, and that just, like, you know, startled me. Just like, just like, did a belly flop right on me. And I was like, stuck in this position, and I couldn't move, and I was like, Mom, Mom, but I could not get my voice out. I was like, Mom, Mom. It was like pins and needles, but it was coming from the inside out instead of the outside in. 
it came off me and I just felt like my whole body just lifted right off the bed and I fell down. It was very frightening. The first night back in the house, the family crowded into one bedroom and refused to turn out the light. Okay, I will. let's lay down. Good night. Good night. Everyone say their prayers. They tossed and turned, five in one bed, four other bedrooms empty. Your feet are freezing. Oh. Would you shut up? This is the most aggravating time. Shh. Let's rest. After midnight, one daughter came into the living room for a cigarette. It's about two o'clock in the morning. And this usually seems to be the time when it'll start building up and you'll start hearing sounds in the house if anything's going to happen. And by three is usually when it gets to the peak. If everybody's sleeping and the house is quiet, that's when it seems like it's the strongest. I feel like it's here and I wish if it was, it would just show itself or do something. The night passed without incident. Day two brought more tests. Psychiatrist Elizabeth Targ worked with the family. It feels like your heart is beating like very hard against your chest. I feel like I can't breathe. I felt like I was dying. <laughs> Technician John Pori conducted physiological tests. The family agreed to sleep that night with the lights out, heads wired to measure sleep patterns and dreams. Our camera was equipped with a night lens to photograph the house in darkness. Christopher Chacon monitored the sensing equipment. This was one night the women wanted something to happen, but again, the house was silent. Everything that we saw in the house on Yudishu Road and everything that's been told to us by the family members could be rationally explained in one way or another according to the laws of nature and physics. I still feel as strongly as we did in the first interview that those things happen in reality. They actually did happen, and they happened the way that I explained them. It's the eternal question for paranormal investigators. If nothing happens, is it all a hoax? Or is the terror the family calls the beast lurking in the background, waiting for the investigators to leave before it will return? I still feel there's a lot of evil in this house. I think that it's the devil personally, and I don't think it's finished. The inability to catch a ghost on tape has proven to be the ultimate frustration for investigators like Christopher Chacon. They continue to work on new, less obtrusive methods of studying ghosts and haunting phenomena. On a recent edition of Sightings, we sent our investigative team to Maryland to help a family plagued by what they believed was a ghost. Although no apparition showed itself to our team, the family continues to be concerned about what they call the beast. So paranormal investigator Peter James has agreed to work with the family on a psychic level. During our initial investigation, the family revealed they were being assaulted by an entity in their house. In the weeks since our team left the site, the ghostly activity has continued unabated. It's been a very active period since they've been gone. They've been gone a couple of weeks and the scratching has started again. Uh, my youngest daughter's been scratched really badly. After seeing a sightings episode featuring psychic Peter James, the family thought they'd finally found someone who could help. We just felt like that's the guy that we need. Somebody who can come in here, identify what it is, and deal with it, and send it on its way. After a brief walk through the house, Peter James felt he was dealing with more than one entity. I would say there are about six ghosts in this house, six entities. I feel we have a forceful entity who is the mainstay, who is the ringleader, so to speak. It wants to gain more control. It wants to maintain control. And my being a fighter of sorts uh, with this sort of activity, uh, I feel that I'll, I'll clean house. Peter then conducted a more thorough inspection of the site to identify paranormal hotspots. Hello? 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 I'm getting a, a uh, <coughs> name <coughs> that I believe um, dwells in this area or certainly within this structure, and I get a name of Philip. I also receive a name of Patrick. I am, I am rather saddened by the vibrations that are here. I, I feel a lot of sadness tonight, but this is truly one of the, um, one of the hearts of, of the house. The family confirmed that the laundry room and the basement were two areas where particularly bizarre events had occurred. Peter was also drawn to an upstairs bedroom. 
I am also picking up a female uh, entity who is loving and that is peaceful that I believe that dwells here, uh, not in this room necessarily, but throughout. And I get the name of Rebecca. And she is with a child, and I believe it is a boy child, and the child answers to the name of Thomas or Tommy. Next, Peter attempted to contact the entity directly and rid the house of its presence. I am receiving a name that from this forceful entity that begins with a D, and I believe this entity's name is Daniel. Ah, uh, Daniel. I am in control here. You are no longer welcome here. Your energy is beginning to weaken now. Be gone now. After Peter James' investigation, the spirit activity in the house stopped. Sightings then conducted a search of area land deeds and real estate records and found a startling document. Peter James, who had never even been to Maryland, had correctly identified the name of the original landowner, a former police chief in the area, whose first name was Daniel. Peter believes Daniel's spirit is the beast that terrorizes the family. He is continuing to stake his claim to this property. He believes that this house is his, and this land is his, and they're invading his possession. And deals with controversial subjects. The theories expressed are not the only possible interpretation. The viewer is invited to make a judgment based on all available information. Tonight, on a special sightings, we search for ghosts in America's most haunted locations. This thing has overtaken my home. And what our team of paranormal experts and psychics uncover, even we can't explain. And it was evil. An exclusive sightings investigation, hunting for ghostly apparitions, next. Welcome to Sightings. I'm Tim White. Tonight, a special edition of Sightings dedicated to ghosts. We'll help a viewer contend with a ghostly presence she believes is haunting her home, and we'll show you the anatomy of a scientific ghost investigation. But first, a trip to 100-year-old Manresa Castle in Port Townsend, Washington. It's a former Jesuit seminary where people try to make contact with what they believe are the tortured spirits of the dead. It's not unusual for Seattle-based photographer Steve Holderman to bring his cameras here to the Manresa Castle in historic Port Townsend, Washington. The castle is over 100 years old, but Steve doesn't come here for the architecture. We came to the castle today to try to capture ghosts. We wanted to see images on film that we can't explain. A paranormal agenda is quite common for the guests at the Manresa. People come from all over the country because they believe the third floor castle turret is an energy vortex that allows spirits to travel between dimensions. People commonly come from all around to see the ghosts. There are people in Seattle that come here regularly to see ghosts, especially on equinoxes. And Halloween night, you will always find somebody occupying 306. The third floor of the Manresa Castle is supposedly haunted by several different ghosts. Historical documents show that at least two people committed suicide here. In room 306, a woman jumped to her death in 1921. Room 302, the famous turret room, is popular with amateur ghost hunters who request the room months in advance, then record their experiences in this special book. Records indicate that when the castle was used as a seminary, one disturbed Jesuit priest hanged himself here. If suicide is somehow a bridge to the paranormal dimension, then that would explain the frightening apparitions with which hotel guests and employees report having come face to face. 
People are often introduced to the castle by newspaper accounts or from former guests. Rod Freeman and Sue Johnston come here regularly with their teenage sons and their friends. They all claim to communicate with spirits through their Ouija board. Definitely the darkest feeling that comes out is, is this Jesuit priest. We uh, decided to ask him for page numbers in the Bible because that's easy to get through the Ouija board. There's a row of numbers there. And sure enough, um, he revealed to us uh, a page number. And uh, it's something that went along with the idea that he was perhaps evil or perverted in his life. And this is what brought him to the point of suicide. And we found a, a passage here in Psalm 101 a perverse nature shall be absent from me. I will not entertain him. Evil I will silence him who secretly slanders his neighbor. I will not tolerate one who is conceited and arrogant. So perhaps he's trying to tell us something about himself. People want to be scared. People want to be scared. That's why we're here. <laughs> That's why we come to experience what others have written about in these diaries that are in the rooms. Sue and her friends have had eerie experiences here. You'll find their paranormal accounts in this hotel diary. I've seen Kate, and I'm pretty sure that she exists. You could make out a face in the shadow. You just, you're frozen and, and just wait for a morning to come so you can share your experiences. You, you don't dare get up. I just, you're too afraid to get up. The forlorn ghost of Kate is by far the most common sighting reported at the castle. Although Kate lost her life in room 306, she's often reported lingering in the turret room. With so much haunting activity in such a concentrated area, sightings arranged for psychic Rhonda Griffin to come here. Psychics claim to be able to tune in to a ghost's paranormal channel. Rhonda has a history of investigating hauntings and asked to be told nothing about the history of the castle. As a professional psychic, Rhonda allows us to see publicly how other guests have reported feeling privately. Right here. I can feel something right in here. It comes right up to the back of my neck. Someone's crying. Someone's crying here. Someone's waiting here. Did she jump out this window? <sighs> the picture I just saw, I saw somebody fall out of this, fall out of a window. And when I saw it, my heart just jumped. Rhonda claimed to be tapping into another dimension. With great emotion, she was able to articulate the tremendous pain and suffering she felt reliving Kate's suicide. Rhonda was describing in great detail shocking events that other guests had only reported seeing briefly. The psychic energy Rhonda was experiencing led her down the hallway to the turret room. I'm feeling an energy vortex coming right down through the center of this. Now, a lot of times the way things are built they'll help to um, amplify particular energies. Now, most places are built on what's called ley lines, okay? Um, and if it's a concentration of energy. Where these ley lines cross is where energy vortexes are created. Rhonda felt that the energy vortex was at its strongest in the castle's attic. Then she began to sense the period when the Manresa was a seminary. It feels like right about here, and I'm like walking through a, like a time warp, and it feels like I'm going back to another time that this place was very different. Um, the structure was very different. It was used, it didn't have a family. It, it, I don't feel a family. Oh, I don't feel a family. The base thought to attract attention. I'm watching a, a man sitting on the floor. He's isolated. He's alone. He's, he's holy. I see him. He's almost like a, he's seated. And he would come up here to... It's despair. It's um, a feeling of 
hopelessness, helplessness. He's very, uh, he's a religious person. He's... <laughs> I see a body swinging. I see a body swinging from a rope. More messages came from the Jesuit priest through Rombat. They were the very same page numbers for the Psalms that Sue Johnston reported finding on the Ouija board weeks before. 103. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and give him all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the grave, who crowns you with loving kindness. And you watch someone do this, and you have to think in the back of your mind, well, this could be a some kind of a put-on type of deal. But then she came up with a couple things tonight that were unexplainable. And how'd she come up with uh, the page number in the Bible? I, I can't explain that. No one else can either. It just happened. After taking over 1,000 photographs at the castle, Steve processed the film in his Seattle studio. Using five different types of black and white and three kinds of high-speed color film, he discovered something he can't explain. This was taken on the same camera, uh, the same uh, film stock. This is just a, the first frame, this is the second frame. And as you can see right here, there's this, a, a weird little bit of density on the film, and I can't... I've looked on it with a loop, and I can't tell what it is. And on this one, you can't see it. It's, I, have, I just can't explain why this is like it is. Some experts claim that this optical phenomenon is typical of other ghost photographs. The castle seems to touch everyone who travels here with an open mind. Is there an energy vortex at work? Believers insist that a trip to Manresa Castle, especially during a full moon, is like taking a cruise to another dimension. Of the thousands of photographs he's taken, Steve Holderman believes the ones he took during our sightings investigation show the clearest evidence of haunting activity. No one's been able to explain the images in the photos using conventional means, since a camera malfunction or a light leak or bad film have all been eliminated. The cause of the strange images in the photographs remains a bona fide mystery. Coming up. This thing has overtaken my home. A family is terrorized by a sinister entity. It was evil. Is this its ghostly image captured on film? The Sightings Hotline was instituted to offer our viewers a chance to bring their paranormal experiences directly to our investigative team. We receive hundreds of phone calls every week, and a large portion of those calls are about ghosts, poltergeists, and haunting phenomena. We screen every call looking for those cases where we feel sightings might make a difference. It's a very unusual situation. What it was or whatever. Black ghost. Uh, it's been really bad. More than being across from my guy. A ghost in our My house. sightings are experienced so anything like this my entire life. When we first began offering our hotline service, we were astonished at the number of people who called to report haunting phenomena. James Brown of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, shared his personal haunting experience with us. Uh, we've had uh, uh, a ghost run up and down our steps while everybody's been there and watched it. Hi, I'm calling from Northern Kentucky. We have a spirit in our house, and it's appeared to us as a little boy. One of my sons sees it almost nightly in the form of a clown. My son's terrified of this. Just outside of Cincinnati, in this northern Kentucky suburb, the Thomason family called sightings about a presence they feel is tormenting their lives. On the surface, this young family appears to be coping well. But scratch this thin veneer, and a starker truth emerges. I can't do anything about it. This thing has overtaken my home. We've heard voices, laughing, uh, things have been moved. It was evil. I mean, you could feel it. The nightmare began in 1991, when the Thomasons moved into this house. They claim strange phenomena hit them immediately. Doors that had been closed and locked started slamming. Objects came off the walls, and Kathy felt a mysterious presence watching her. I was in the bathroom, and he was looking in at me as I was taking a shower. I turned to look, and he disappeared. 
Things got much worse for the family when three-year-old Mikey started describing apparitions in his bedroom at night, an apparition that took the form of a clown. He's just totally, deathly afraid to be in his room by himself. He will sit there and cry and scream that he's scared. And he would say, the, the clown is in my room. Why is it that the image of a clown is tormenting this family? The Thomasons believe it may be the spirit of a boy who followed them home after a weekend trip to what had been a country club. We had come here to see what was going on because we had heard the rumors of devil worship. It's since uh, burned down, it was, it was arson, but we think this is where we picked up the spirit of the little boy. Many parapsychologists theorize that spirits can attach themselves to living people for security. But why then would the little boy be tormenting the family? It just seems like it wants us apart. And it wants me out of the picture. I feel that very strongly. They need something done because it's going to end up tearing up their family. In desperation, Kathy called the sightings hotline. We responded by asking Dr. William Roll to survey the home using scientific instrumentation. 1.0. I brought in a magnetometer that measures magnetic fields, and we have found that um, psychic experiences seem to occur in regions where there are strong magnetic fields. Unusually high levels of electromagnetism were found in the hallway between the two boys' rooms. So we have a high magnetic field in this area. Then he interviewed each family member. He was particularly sensitive to the fears expressed by Mikey. You like the clown or you don't like him? I don't like him. Show me where you, where you saw the clown. Now, just point to it. That. Okay, all right. The results of Dr. Roll's investigation failed to prove conclusively that a ghost exists in the home. He did, however, have a recommendation based on his findings. They need to get rid of the strong magnetic fields in the bedrooms of the two boys. The main electrical wires coming into the home are located directly adjacent to the boys' rooms. There may be a connection between this electric source and the experiences of Jimmy and Mikey. Psychic Irene Hughes was also part of our sightings investigation. She carefully examined each room and tried to telepathically communicate with any spirits in the home. Irene then worked with Mikey, guiding him through a series of specially designed exercises. Her goal was to help him cope with his fears. Clown leave. Clown leave. Okay, we're going to tell you bye-bye. Bye-bye. That night, for the first time in more than a year, nothing unusual happened in the Thomason home. Apparently what she did took care of the problem. There were no unusual sounds, no bouncing around, no footsteps, there was nothing. After Irene Hughes left the house, our investigative team took more videotape and photographs at the site. Later, when the still camera film was developed, something strange appeared. This photograph shows an unusual and unexplained formation on the right side of the frame. Ghost experts we showed it to said this image is consistent with other alleged ghost photographs. As soon as we discovered this new photographic evidence, we alerted the family. Although they feel the ghost is now out of their lives, they promised to keep us informed if the haunting phenomenon returns. Coming up, a sightings exclusive. A team of paranormal experts attempts to contact a frightening ghost haunting this California landmark next. In previous ghost investigations, we've often called in the experts at the Office of Scientific Investigation and Research. But in this case, they contacted us with an important new investigation. In Ventura, California, there have been unsettling reports of spirits haunting what was a turn-of-the-century hospital. And now the haunting activity appears to be spreading to the surrounding neighborhood. The haunting began at a city landmark. High above Ventura, California, the old Bard Hospital has been the scene of numerous ghost sightings. And now reports of haunting activity are coming from almost every building on this block. Local residents are scared. And they've called in Christopher Chacon, Peter Aykroyd, and John Berry from the Office of Scientific Investigation and Research. We were contacted by various people in this community because there have been a variety of strange events occurring, including apparitions or ghosts, if you want to call them. We haven't been able to discern that specifically. But uh, some pretty spooky kind of stuff has been going on up here, so we thought we'd check it out. It opened up this far for fully a beat, and then it closed again. 
I was sleeping, it was about 2.30 in the morning, and a voice said, hey, woke me up, and I felt a tap on the shoulder. He had a very cold, strange look in his face, almost very empty. For the last several years, residents claim that an entity or entities have made their presence felt to those who live and work around the hospital, now converted to offices. Tina, a former office worker, claims to have encountered several spirits. Her identity is hidden because Tina fears reprisals from the spirits. I felt a cold hand touch my shoulder, and I looked in the direction, and standing there was this old man with white, gray hair, and I just remember his face was very defined. This startled me so bad, I just stormed down the stairs and headed out the door, and the door slammed shut. And uh, I looked, and the guy was there again. Some believe this old man, who has been spotted on several different occasions, is actually the spirit of Cephas Bard, founder of the original hospital. It's assumed it's Dr. Bard. There's, I'm told that there's another presence, which is a young girl. Uh, she was apparently run over by a milk wagon or something, and she died in this hospital as well. But there are other theories about the paranormal activity plaguing this neighborhood. I have found that ghosts seem to be active in areas where you have different cultures in conflict. And here we have the Indian people, the Spaniards, Mexicans, Chinese, Yankees, all sorts of different people. And when you have these groups, sometimes in bloody confrontation, that leaves things behind. The structures in this Ventura neighborhood were built on the site of an ancient Chumash Indian burial ground. Could this be the source of the haunting? You were walking through the parking lot and you looked over to one side and there was a group of Native Americans standing there, paint, no clothes, but with some sort of paint on? Right, and I remember beads and there were ch men and there was children and women. I got in my car, started to drive away, and as I backed up, I looked in the window and all of a sudden, just like that, no one was there. Later that night, I participated in an overnight surveillance at the old hospital. The equipment that you're using is, is pretty high-tech stuff. This is the what now? Uh, these are Generation 3 night vision goggles. And uh, these are able to give us complete visual capability in total darkness. So in complete darkness, I could still see something. It's really pretty amazing. You can see everything, and it's all washed in green light. But you can see quite a bit of detail. Uh, would I see everything I could normally see in daylight here? That and more, I'd say. Mm -hmm. You can see more? In the infrared mode, it picks up uh, aspects mm. of the luminous environment that we can't perceive with the normal naked eye. Peter Aykroyd and the other members of the OSIR research team have conducted over 600 paranormal investigations, and in each case, they must find unique solutions to the problems associated with finding ghosts. This particular investigation is just beginning, and it will be many more months before the team can draw any conclusions about the source of the paranormal activity in this neighborhood. They are hopeful, however, that this will be the case where they can not only pick up the presence of spirits through their equipment, but also communicate with the entities reported here. As you've seen tonight, viewer participation is essential to our sightings investigations. If you've experienced what you believe to be a ghost or any other type of paranormal activity, our sightings investigative team wants to know about it. If you've had a paranormal experience, call the sightings hotline at 1-900-740-SIGHT. Each call 75 cents a minute, average call lasts two minutes, and you must be 18 years or older. Join us next time for new investigations into the unexplained. For sightings, I'm Tim White. Tomorrow, officers risk their lives to free a hostage from a gang of drug dealers. Witness incredible police rescues on a special edition of Code 3, right after Cops. Now stay tuned for more sightings next. This edition of Sightings, a frightening entity leaves a bloody trail. Sally, stop it! On tape, it's a stunning paranormal event. She scares the living daylights out of me. Then, from America's UFO hotspot, evidence of an extraterrestrial invasion. We've seen an extraordinary increase in 
large scale contact events. And this man's gift is haunted by the faces of death. I bring life to death through my artistic abilities. Welcome to Sightings. I'm Tim White. A ghostly presence on videotape. It's the one piece of hard evidence that's eluded our ghost investigations. Until now. When Sightings received a call from a beleaguered family in the Midwest, our team went to investigate. What they found was haunting activity unlike anything this Sightings crew had ever seen. The result was hours of bizarre ghostly activity captured for the first time on videotape. It's happening here, somewhere in America's heartland. The family has asked that we not say exactly where they live, but it's a town like any other where people work, raise a family, and are laid to rest. There, however, the similarity ends. We were told at least one soul here is not at rest, and that her spirit is trapped inside this house. Spirit, ghost, entity. It has many names, and many ways of making its presence known. The family here fears ridicule and persecution. They've asked us not to use their real names, so we'll refer to them as Pamela, Jeff, and their infant son, Donnie. The first signs of something out of the ordinary began when the young couple moved into this 128-year-old house in January of 1993. At first, the haunting activity was subtle and only seemed to be occurring in one small bedroom at the top of the stairs. Pamela and Jeff had a weird, indefinable feeling that something wasn't quite right. Their usually docile dog started feeling it too. She would whimper and cry any time she came near that room. They now feel the persistent barking was a warning they did not heed. As these home videos show, after the birth of their son, Donnie, the bedroom was converted into a nursery. It was here that an entity began to show itself. Pictures of newborn Donnie were marred by strange blocks of free-floating light and shadow. It happened on roll after roll of film and with two different cameras. Even more bizarre was the discovery, when this photo was enlarged, that the crayon on the tablet seems to be held in space by an invisible hand. We tried to recreate this photo with wires, pins, and other tricks. We could not. Through a friend, Pamela contacted psychic Barbara Connor, who believes she can communicate with entities from the past. I was thinking it was a little crowded. Yeah, she doesn't like it. She says, too many people are in here. Get out. Within a few minutes of her arrival, Barbara began to communicate with what she felt was the spirit of a child. She said the spirit was that of a little girl named Sally and that she was there to protect the baby Donnie. Barbara believes that the blurs and streaks in dozens of family photographs are actually a physical manifestation of Sally. We wanted Edson Williams, a trick photography expert, to give us his opinion. Sightings obtained the original negatives and photos, and with the family's approval, had them analyzed to determine if anything in the camera or in the film processing could account for the bizarre images. One photo that I really caught my attention was the Christmas photos. The, the highlights that ran through the image, they're localized, they're not throughout the image, they're in very small regions, and they're running at different angles. I, initially, I tried to recreate this simply with a, a few quick tricks, and unfortunately, they did not work for me. It would be a very difficult shot to recreate. Another photograph I found very interesting was one I had a small child's toy in a corner with a, a blue ghosting image around it. Uh, initially, I thought it possibly it cut out a blue gel, which would be a, a blue plastic, clear plastic, and a wiggle that in front of the camera could recreate it. But the density differences were too varied. Photographic evidence is something I always question because my job is to create illusions photographically. But these several pictures that I was shown are very difficult to explain. The family believes this is evidence of Sally, the lost spirit of a long dead girl. 
And like a macabre version of Mother Goose, when Sally is good, she's very, very good, and when she's bad, she's horrid. According to Pamela and Jeff, this is Sally's handiwork. They say a swirling, frigid aura announces her presence. Then Sally leaves welting, bloody slashes on Jeff's bare flesh, as documented in these photos and verified by many eyewitnesses. So far, Jeff has been the only victim. When our sightings crew arrived to investigate, the first step was to videotape interviews with Pamela and Jeff. These interviews were important, but the director had given strict orders to immediately turn the cameras on any strange activity as soon as it occurred. It was during this first interview session that the entity made its presence known. Jeff and Donnie watched from just behind the camera as Pamela was being interviewed first. We had gone over to my in-laws. We had come home. Um, shortly afterwards, we found all the stuffed animals that were in As Pamela areas. described a previous encounter with Sally, noise from a backyard chainsaw started to interfere with the videotaping. The were closed. The cats were downstairs with us. Um, just nothing natural could happen. As Pamela waited for the noise to stop, Jeff called out. Is it, is it going? She don't like everybody here, did <laughs> Sally, stop it. What? How did that happen? You don't know. I, I, uh... Sally? Go on and walk in there. Walk in there. And, and get a towel and clean it off his arm. Stay What's going on? Uh, I gotta get my sense of it. She's right here, because it is freezing right here. It is freezing. I feel it. All you do is you feel this cold go through you. That's how I just Sally? Look back. Okay, Sally, it. we're gonna stop. Us? Sally, we're gonna stop until Barbara comes here, okay? When Barbara comes, she'll cool she'll right talk here. to you and let you know. Right here. Uh -huh. I can feel it. We're we're interviewing. It's hot. We've turned the air conditioner off for sound purposes, but it is cold right here in this part of the room. And the air conditioner is off. Mm-hmm. I just felt Look at that. The cold Look at just that. Like freeze me over here. This is the same thing that occurs when Holy she's God. scratched his face. Holy. Or he's had scratches across his forehead or down his arm. She does this when she's upset. I'm still shaking. <laughs> I know, my heart's pounding too. I think... I'm a little excited. I gotta tell you. We've had a little excitement this morning. Oh, really? Already? Yeah. The family asked psychic Barbara Connor to join our investigation. They felt Barbara could communicate with Sally and help calm her down. Feeling good? <laughs> What's this? That's, That's what she just did. She just did this? Yeah. I feel her now. Yeah, she's here. Hi, Sally. What's going on? Excitement. <laughs> yeah. She's excited. It's really cold. Okay, okay, it's okay. Yeah, it's, uh, she's excited about all this. Is she yeah. liking it, or yeah. is she upset? She's upset. She's a little upset. Um, what's going on here? She says, I like it, but it's scary. Yeah, well, honey, it's scary for us, too. Yeah, We've that's never what done I, anything like that. That's what I told her. I said, I said, no, it's everybody's uptight with this. I, she scares the living daylights out of me. To be honest with you, I, I'm going to add this right now. She's right here with me right now. <laughs> I'm feeling something really cold shoot around my stomach. Um, we asked Jeff to describe what he was feeling. He looked like he was in pain, but Jeff didn't respond. For a moment, he couldn't speak. <sighs> I've lost my breath. I'm sorry. Today, in the chair, as you guys were interviewing my wife, I was sitting in the rocking chair with my son. He was playing with a little toy, and we were tilted a little forward so we could watch the interview through the doorway. When this cold just shot through my arm, and it's done it before, I knew the feeling. It's just, I can't explain the cold. It's, it freezes your bones, everything. And as I looked towards my arm, I had four scratches that were bleeding as I looked at him and it's really frightening yeah. <sighs> she's just went right through my midsection I don't... oh my god look 
Come, look. I... Oh, look, they're forming. Can't come up with an explanation why she does this. It's forming right there. She tends to do this to me because I upset her sometimes. I... And she wants to be noticed, I think, today. <laughs> This family has asked to remain anonymous. Uh, what's happening inside their house is so bizarre, they don't want to become just another media event. When we return, our investigation continues. Coming up next on Sightings. And this is like the most profound thing I've ever seen in all parapsychology. This is fact, and you have it on tape. In the years we've been doing this program, our ghost investigations have been time-consuming and often frustrating. But the current case in the Midwest is clearly different. From day one, the crew was experiencing unexplainable haunting phenomena. And they were getting it on tape. It's a sensation like uh, the air conditioning on your automobile. If you put your hand up right in front of the vent, you feel the air Real blowing. Fresh Real cooking. fresh. But if you move yeah. your hand away from the vent, it goes away. Oh. I think she's it's, messing with you. It is swirling. Our sightings director is Greg Cook. He was excited about the presence of strange cold spots that would come and go without warning or reason. It is so cold right here. Oh, what's this electrical charge you're talking about? Did you feel it? Did you feel it? <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like a, mi a mild electrical mild. shock. Yeah. Right there. Oh, my God. Can you feel it? Yeah. That's oh, Jesus. Electrical shock. Right here. That is unbelievable. Paranormal investigator Howard Heim brought in instruments that could measure the cold and magnetic energy everyone in the house was feeling. Howard Heim has documented over 100 reported hauntings throughout the world. Strangely enough, as soon as he arrived, our video camera began to malfunction. There was breakup, usually a sign that there's been some kind of electrical interference. Come here. No, I cannot. As soon as you came over, it went this way. You can feel it? Well, let's take a few minutes. It's 77.7 .7 degrees Fahrenheit in here. This dropped a point. It did instantly drop point then, from, then go, from point seven to point just, six. Just there. No, wait right there. It just dropped another point. It's dropping again. Point four. It dropped again. It's point three now. And I gradually and it dropped a point again. It's now point two. It keeps getting cooler in this room. It's like a narrow shaft of yeah. cool air. Mm hmm It is. And my hand is, I can feel it coming down, but his hand's on top of mine. And if you put yours underneath, you should be able to feel it as well, even yeah. though... Ooh, I actually feel, feel it slightly yeah, feel, cooler. Feel that? Yeah. Blowing around? Yeah. I actually feel like a small uh, circumference hand, about uh, four inches in diameter coming straight down. And our hands are blocking the airflow. Mm hmm Hmm. That was interesting. It was almost like a narrow thing it's hitting the back of my hand. The instruments picked up both an increase in electromagnetism and a measurable decrease in room temperature. But no instrument could explain what happened just a few minutes later in the kitchen. Pamela was showing Barbara a teddy bear that had been inexplicably burned. Later in the same spot, Sally seemed to be telling Pamela she was the fire starter. My husband found this kind of half fresh, half dead flower singed around the edges. Is it possible that Sally burned the rose in reaction to Pamela's discussion about the teddy bear? We went back to that earlier moment on our raw field tapes. The rose was there on the windowsill, but at this point it appeared fully red with undamaged petals. Who could have burned that rose without anyone seeing it or smelling it in the space of less than five minutes? That's incredible. The interior leaves are burnt around the edges with no damage to the overlapping leaves, as if they were individually burned and then assembled. Mm. That is bizarre. That you can't you can't duplicate this. This cannot be duplicated. Well, 
let's uh, go see, show me where she lives, <laughs> so to speak, here. And uh, um, this yeah. used to be this cradle, but we've put it in here as like a gathering for her toys, things that she's allowed to play with and not get into trouble for. In the bedroom that had been the source of so much haunting activity, electromagnetic field readings were normal at first. Then Pamela felt that Sally had arrived. Oh, man. Yeah. Right here. The magnetometer needle jumped. Look at it. We're two and a half. Now we're at three. I can actually feel it between my fingers. It's very light, but it is noticeable. It's still me. During our investigation, Everyone who entered the house felt an eerie, ghostly presence. But only Jeff claims to have actually seen a manifestation of Sally. I walked over to the kitchen cabinet, opened the cabinet and got out a glass, poured more orange juice. Started to take a drink, and as I turned around, there was a little girl standing not more than three foot away from me, just as plain as you are to me now. Just standing there with this plain look on her face, just looking at me like, she was curious about me too and it oh i can't explain the, <laughs> the feeling i got i dropped the glass the glass shattered and as i dropped the glass she was gone just as quick as she was there it was just gone sally never materialized for our low light intensity viewing equipment but our normal video camera did pick up perhaps the most stunning paranormal event ever recorded on tape. It came without warning as our cameras were in the process of recording one final scene. Sally, can you see through it? Does it work? Yeah. And, and go up? The top. Very slowly, yeah. Same, look, one's starting to bleed. There's a whole new... Get the new one? Oh, look at that. Oh, look at god. that. Oh, look at that. Oh, my god. It actually I knew just, she was around. <laughs> it's this nice dark one where look. it's bleeding. Look, <laughs> look at that. Look at, the look at that. It's standing on down. Look there it is. Bottom. Look at it. We trained our cameras on Jeff's torso for nine minutes, the entire duration of the bizarre event. What first appeared as scratches eventually grew into long, thick, bleeding welts. No one had a logical explanation. It just simply appeared. You lifted your shirt, the same scratches were there. You put this to your stomach, and all of a sudden, blood started to ooze out. And this is like the most profound thing I've ever seen in all parapsychology. I've seen and felt a few things myself, but it could be suggestion. But th this is not suggestion at all. This is fact, and you have it on tape. When our crew returned from the Midwest, the excitement in the sightings offices was palpable. Our videotape has become the object of intense interest for paranormal investigators like Kerry Gaynor. We asked him to view the tape, making careful examination yeah, in side-by-side -side views of the before and after frames taken while this bleeding scratch welted up before our camera. When we return, I'll be joined by field director Greg Cook and world-renowned parapsychologist Kerry Gaynor as we continue this remarkable investigation. Coming up next, historic contact with an entity. And later, from America's UFO hotspot, unprecedented daylight sightings captured on tape. Joining me now is sightings director Greg Cook. Greg supervised the crew on site during our investigation. Greg, you've earned your stripes in the news business for a long time. You've worked for 60 Minutes and elsewhere. Has anything like this ever happened before? Never, Tim. Uh, the frightening thing was that it happened early in the day, at 10 o'clock in the morning, with all of the movie lights on and all the people through the house. It wasn't like what you would presume you see when you see a ghost. It didn't happen late at night under candlelight and that sort of thing. It was in the confusion of the crew arriving mm -hmm. and uh, in daylight hours, and everybody felt it. It was, it was, that was the frightening thing. You actually felt this thing happen. Everybody in the crew did. We saw the, uh, we saw the rows and we saw the marks on the man's body. There was another incident that you didn't have yeah. the bib? There was a shot that I thought might be interesting if she were to walk in carrying the baby, and the baby at the time was sitting in the high chair. So I said, let's just, you know, move to this area of the mm -hmm. room, walk in, and we'll begin. She took off the baby's bib, took 10 steps mm -hmm. to the left and walked back in again and went to put the bib on. It would not attach. The, the plastic cap mm -hmm. beneath the bib had burned 
in the 20 seconds it took for her to walk away from the bib. I immediately smelled it and could, could smell a sense of charcoal and burning, but the plastic had melted, but there was no fire damage to the top or bottom of that piece of plastic. And that occurred right while we were there. And it was a sort of a frightening moment. That, that did occur at night, and uh, I felt a little uneasy about staying there. Well, you're a skeptical guy. Uh, yeah. Couldn't all of this have been faked somehow? No, no. If we'd gone there and perhaps what you saw was, was cutting and bleeding, you might question how did that happen. The fact was that everybody who came, film members, other friends of theirs, neighbors mm -hmm. who had been there for the time of the taping, everybody in the room felt the same sensation of cold. I think there's a lot of interpretation there. Mm -hmm. But I do know that what I felt and what everybody else in our crew felt was uh, a definite electrical energy. Mm -hmm. It moved around the room. You could follow it around the room. It wasn't something that we just kind of said, well, we thought it was there. It was there. Well, Greg, since you filed this report, Sightings has contacted parapsychologist Kerry Gaynor and asked for his insight. Mr. Gaynor is best known for his investigations of the now famous entity and poltergeist cases. Mr. Gaynor, you've had a chance to look at our field videotapes. What do you think? Well, I think it's very exciting. The, the nice thing for me as a researcher is that the cameraman held the camera on the blood spot from the moment it started to the moment the welts appeared. He never cut away. So we have about eight or nine minutes of raw footage, which I have examined. And it's very interesting. It's very exciting. I spent a great deal of time trying to determine which cases are worth investigating and which are not. And I think this one is. What are some of the more common signs of a haunting? Things that show up here as well as other cases you've looked into? Well, one of the things I was intrigued by were the, the bears that were found in the middle of the room. And they went out of the room and they put the bears back. They came back and one bear was found in the middle of the room. This like poltergeist? That's right. This suggests a very playful kind of experience. And we come across this a lot. People take their clothes out. They get up the next morning. They're back in the drawer again. Just playful type phenomena. You think this family is at threat, in danger? Well, I think there are different types of things going on in this house. I wouldn't want to think... I wouldn't think there's one explanation. The, the, the bears appearing in the middle of the room is a, is a playful type poltergeist experience. But the scratches on the man's stomach and his arm, and uh, according to his testimony, he was yanked out of his bed. Those are pretty terrifying experiences. And yes, I, I'm a little concerned about that. We'll continue to look into it. Parapsychologist Kerry Gaynor, thanks for joining us. Thank you. On this edition of Sightings, Tim White and an investigative team encounter a frightening entity. I can tell that uh, you're losing your breath right now. Oh, man. That's weird. These women share a terrifying memory of alien abduction. Do angels exist? These children believe they were saved by spirits from beyond. Absolutely no way that we could have made without some kind of help. And in Colorado, a deadly mystery continues. Welcome to Sightings. I'm Tim White. Recently, we brought you the story of a Midwestern family that's been plagued by bizarre haunting activity. Well, from our initial investigation, the videotape that our sightings crew brought back was unlike anything we'd ever seen before. We brought in renowned ghost investigator Al Rober to join our team, and along with the crew, Al and I went to meet the family. The family wishes to remain anonymous. We're using pseudonyms here and concealing the father's identity. How are the, um, the scratches that you had that we saw before, are they healing? Well, this is sent here scarred. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the uh, ones on my stomach are healing up pretty good. Just two weeks before, these bleeding welts materialized on camera during our first sightings investigation. The tape of that event was analyzed by Carrie Gaynor, world-renowned parapsychologist who was lead investigator on both the entity and poltergeist cases. He asked to view the images of this bizarre event side by side. On the right, a frame of video with a long bleeding welt. On the left, an image taken eight minutes earlier when our camera first began to roll. There's no welt visible. The exciting thing for me as a researcher is that the camera didn't pull away. It was there the whole time and that 
severely reduces the, the possibility of any kind of hoax. Most of the cases we come across are playful, mischievous, bizarre, weird, and a lot of them have just normal natural explanations. This case that involves scratch marks, this seems a little more frightening and something that we should be a little more cautious about in terms of, of studying the phenomena. The phenomena in this house, according to the family who lives here, are caused by Sally, the spirit of a seven-year-old child. They believe it's Sally who causes paranormal activity, like lights flickering on and off mysteriously, as seen in this home video. Thank you, Sally. Yeah, on the left side. Right. Family photos have turned up with unusual blurring and discoloration, confounding our photo experts. During our initial investigation, paranormal researcher Howard Heim felt and recorded strange sensations of cold and electromagnetism. I actually feel like a small uh, circumference head. about uh, four inches in diameter coming straight down. Sightings camera operator Phil Lapkin was startled when an intense charge of static electricity began swirling around him. Our audio equipment was able to record a snapping sound along the floor and around his legs. On our return to the house, we asked ghost investigator Al Rober to gather additional hard data at the site. His equipment can monitor electromagnetic energy and minute temperature fluctuations. He photographed and examined items that were supposedly touched and in some cases burned by the entity. There's a chemical that's built on this. Tim? Yeah. I would assume from that, Greg, that you are feeling... Well, that... Something. Air conditioner's off. I feel it blowing right through here. Mm -hmm. Well, a little bit. I'm going to move over here and see if I can feel the same thing, though. Yeah, now we're in front of a window and an air conditioner right. that's off. Right. All right, I, can, I, I definitely can feel a sense of, uh, of some air moving there. Yeah. Let, let, let's sit back down and talk. And Tony, Tony, as we continued uh, videotaping, I was not the only member of the sightings crew who seemed to feel a strange sensation of cold air circulating in small, isolated patches. It happened again and again. Oh, man. That's weird. It's right, yeah, right here. Ooh, and boy. the hair on your arms, uh, uh, he's standing up. Right here. I can see a, see the hair yeah. over in this area here. Ooh, just right, right here. No, no, behind you too. In and of itself, the sensation of cold and static electricity was intriguing but not proof of the existence of Sally. However, the sensations, some were feeling more strongly than others, were usually followed by physical harm to Jeff. More. Oh, well, now that's very interesting. Why don't you sit down first? Why don't you sit down? I can, t I can tell that uh, you're, you're losing your breath right now. <laughs> Sally, what did I tell you? Sally, we see you. Uh, we know you're here. Whoever, or whatever, was responsible for these painful scratches struck repeatedly throughout the day. At one point, new welts began to form on Jeff's stomach. Then, I was shocked to see mysterious welts forming on his forehead. This whole spirit thing scares me, and it just, some of the things she's done, she's lit fires, and I... You know, I think, well, if she wants to hurt me, why couldn't she just light me on fire or whatever she does to some of the other things around here? But, yeah, this is as far as she goes. Al, are you saying that virtually everything that you've seen here today could be explained through psychokinesis or some sort of projection? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. Understanding his feelings here and his intense fear, he's very, he's very frightened and uncomfortable being thrust into this environment. That's not to say that there isn't uh, a little girl ghost walking around because in cases when you do have a poltergeist, they seem to draw off the same energies. What would your advice be to the couple living here? Um, one of the things I would, I would tell them would be to try to document some more of this. Uh, another thing that I would do, I would certainly recommend them to get rid of the toys in the corner and get rid of any encouragement that that is now going on for this little girl ghost whether the source of this bizarre activity lies within jeff or in an outside entity who craves attention the result is still unexplainable what type of energy could create the frightening diverse phenomena occurring here 
being on site observing the ghostly activity as it happens has been a disturbing experience. It's clear that this case merits continued investigation. And whatever comes of it, uh, we will try and pursue it as openly and honestly as we can here on sightings, and we will share it with you. We'll be back with more sightings in a moment. It was a parent's worst nightmare. In 1987, a madman in Cokeville, Wyoming, took children hostage, then detonated a bomb in an elementary school classroom. Miraculously, none of the children died. Since then, books and movies have recounted the amazing story of the Cokeville bomb and speculated about why the children were spared. But now, for the first time, the children themselves speak out about how they believe they were saved. Their stories have a common thread, the presence of angels. Cokeville, Wyoming, population 493. They say it's like no place on earth. And that was never more true than on the day local children believe angels came to school. It started here around 11 a.m. when David and Doris Young, armed with guns and a bomb, took the entire school hostage. I said to them, is there something I could do to help you, sir? And he said, yes, ma'am, there certainly is. This is a revolution. Your school's being taken hostage. Consider yourself a hostage. If you'd looked in David Young's eyes, you knew it was no joke. I've never, ever looked in anyone's eyes that were so cold and so emotionless. I mean, there was like this big void. There was nothing there. David Young was a walking arsenal. In addition to automatic rifles, his body was wired to a bomb that could be detonated with a wave of his hand. He said the bomb was capable of blowing up the entire building. He said it will level this whole building and everyone in it. The hardest part of the whole thing was that I started out in this thing alone, and I couldn't warn anyone. With a gun to her back, Mrs. Cook was forced to lead David and Doris Young to the school's first grade classroom. David Young made this his command center and forced all 153 teachers and students of the Cokeville Elementary School into the small room. He then demanded a $2 million ransom for each hostage. He said, this is a revolution. I'm holding you hostage. And um, one of the girls in my class it just went hysterical. Young gave each teacher a copy of a bizarre manifesto outlining his apocalyptic plan for the children of Cokeville. He said, God equals infinity, infinity equals zero, therefore God does not exist. David Young was insane, incoherent, and unreasonable. He was a human bomb with a hair trigger. The ultimate plan was he was going to, after he got the money, blow the building, the children, the adults, himself and his wife, everything. He was going to blow it all up and take us to this place that he referred to as the Brave New World. While the local police, sheriffs, and the FBI were outside, inside, the sense of panic was escalating. We had children sick to their stomach, crying, you know, and, and asking their teachers, why can't we go home? I want to go home. Young grew more agitated. He taped off an area in the middle of the room where only he and Doris could sit. If anyone else stepped inside his square, he said he would detonate the bomb. Strangely, with the youngs inside the square, the children felt safer. It was just like this total peace and this comforting feeling just touched everybody. It was just a feeling just to be relaxed and not to worry that you'll make it through it. I guess you could ex explain it as peace. Always, you know, that nothing could happen to us. The peace was fleeting. Without warning, the bomb went off. The room was almost instantaneous black. And we had teachers over there that were grabbing kids, trying to get them out through the classroom windows. This lady grabbed my hand, and, and she pushed me out the window. And I don't, I don't know if I would have made it out, because I was too afraid to move. That was the most frightening experience. Not knowing how many had left, if any, and my classmates. Miraculously, the only two people who died that day were David and Doris Young. Everyone outside the so-called Magic Square survived. And I heard Mr. Moore and a whole bunch of people start yelling, you know, 
we're all here, we all counted, we're all here. And that's when everybody in the town just started yelling, you know, that everybody was there. And it was, it was a great moment. Even though we were sad, kids were burned, kids were hurt. We were very happy we were all alive. And I could see my youngest daughter, Katie, sitting on the ground. I went to her and I embraced her. And she, at that point, stood and told me, Mommy, the angel saved us. In the chaos and everything that was happening, I think that maybe I didn't take her literally. Katie wasn't the only child who talked about angels in the classroom. As the town struggled to recover from their shared trauma, other children began quietly admitting that they'd been helped by angels too. I just kind of looked up and I saw this woman and she told me that to listen to my brother and everything would be okay. And I looked up again and she wasn't there anymore. And then my brother came over and he told me to stay by the window and everything would be okay. And he walked back across the room and that's when the bomb went off. A few weeks later, Katie saw the face of her angel again. She gazed out at Katie from her mother's locket. My mother had passed away when I was 15 and a half years old. And I had very few pictures of her. As soon as I opened the locket, she became so excited. And she looked at this woman in this locket and said, that's who she is. That's the woman that helped me. She described this woman down to her hair where she was standing in the room. Everything about this woman, as if she had known her all her life. The woman in the locket was Katie's maternal grandmother, whom the child had never seen. She'd been dead for more than 13 years. When I saw the photo, they told me that she died, and I came to the realization that she had been sent to help me, and that she was my guardian angel. In the days that followed, trauma counselors heard from many children who had seen their own guardian angel, but not every parent believed what their children were telling them. I did not want my, my own son, flesh and blood, going around saying that he saw an angel. Ron Hartley had four children inside Cokeville Elementary when the bomb went off, but he was also the police detective in charge of the investigation. When his own son, Nathan, insisted that he had seen an angel, Hartley tried to be a cop first and a dad second. I just interviewed and interrogated my son. He said that uh, he was sitting there and all of a sudden these angels came down through the uh, ceiling and uh, one of them came up to him and uh, just basic said, Nathan, I'm your great-grandmother, and what David and Doris are doing is wrong. And uh, he said, the bomb's going to go off. And I says, what was her name, Nathan? And he says, I think it was Grandma Meister. Well, I thought I had something there because I, that I could use to straighten him out because it, his grandmother Meister was still alive. So I resorted back to another cop technique, which is bring out the mug shots. We was thumbing through it, and all of a sudden there's a picture of both his uh, grandmothers sitting there. And he just immediately put his little hand uh, on the page so I couldn't turn it. He says, that's her. He says, that's my guardian angel. He pointed to my grandma Elliot. Uh, who was sitting right next to Grandma Meister. I says, Nathan, I says, why didn't you tell us this before? And uh, he just looked at me and he says, Dad, you wouldn't believe me. Whether or not there were angels in the room that day, some unseen force was at work. Investigators at the scene reported that the bomb was fully functional and should have been lethal. It should have been 160 people dead. Bomb technician Richard Haskell says the bomb should have been much more destructive. From where this window is down here to the, uh, to the north, everything on this side should have been gone. This wall should have been just literally laying down on the, on the grass. All the bricks and everything, it shouldn't even have been here. It should have been gone. In the aftermath, police videotaped the bombed out classroom. An image is clearly visible on the southeast wall. Another photo of the area captures what looks like the silhouette of an angelic figure. The children say, this is where one of the angels stood. That was a sign showing us, you know, that yes, this was a miracle. Um, be grateful. 
I think there probably were, were angels in the room when the bomb went off. And so, like, the image was just impacted on the wall. There was an angel for everybody watching over him that day. There's absolutely no way that we could have made, made it through that without some kind of help. There is an invisible energy that exists between magnet and metal. You can't see it or touch it, but you know that it's there. Some paranormal investigators believe that people generate a similar kind of energy, which remains in the environment even after death. They call it residue. These investigators suggest that what many people experience as a haunting may actually be their ability to feel, hear, or even see the existence of this spiritual residue. California, 1850, a stagecoach stop with good food and clean beds. Today, it's an historic landmark with a different kind of reputation. The Whaley House is considered one of the most haunted places in the West. Sandy Stokes was a reporter for the San Diego Press Enterprise when she investigated the Whaley House for a special Halloween story. So to do a little bit of research to make sure that it was really haunted, I called up some ghost hunters, and one of the people I called was Richard Sennett. So I sort of challenged her. I said, well, go ahead. Go down to the Whaley House. Use a tape recorder. Use brand new music quality tape. Go from room to room, and when you're done, play it back and see if there isn't something that shouldn't be there. So I took his advice, and I came down here, and June Redding gave me a tour. In her 34 years as director of the Whaley House, June Redding has experienced all kinds of haunting phenomena. She's convinced that Mrs. Whaley, a professional musician at the turn of the century, is still demonstrating her talents. And we think perhaps she, her spirit isn't strong enough to return, but we have music coming from the uh, music room, piano and violin music at times. We have the sound of a music box, a strain of a music box. It's not one of ours here. Would Sandy's tape recorder pick up this anomalous music? When I got back and played the tape, it was very interesting. I heard some sounds on it that hadn't, we hadn't heard while we were walking through the house and I was interviewing her. EVP is electronic voice phenomenon, and this first began in the 1970s when people using tape recorders began to get extra sounds that shouldn't be there. The tape was digitally analyzed by EVP expert Brian Black. He discovered background sounds, like clacking billiard balls, while June was giving Sandy a tour. So was that, was that on there when it was a courtroom thing? Yeah. Oh, and these are good. This is an interesting one. Do you ever feel ghosts? Oh, yeah. What does it feel like? Brian recorded billiard sounds and compared them to the sounds on the tape, but it wasn't a match. I did some uh, research on the history of billiards and discovered that uh, what they use for billiard balls has changed considerably. Brian consulted with Terry Moldenauer, an expert on antique billiards. The ivory balls were used from the early 1800s on up till about the 1930s, 40s, uh, just recently when we went into the plastics. When Brian repeated the test with ivory balls, the results were remarkable. Well, if you put the anomaly as, as a 10, something what would compare to it, uh, I'd say an ivory comes in about a 7 or an 8. Phenolic resin, the plastic that they use today, is too sharp and crisp. When Brian told me that he had that he had f proved that it was the actual sound of a billiard game with balls that had not been in use since the turn of the century, I was really surprised. I was shocked. Why were billiard sounds recorded in a part of the house that was once a county courtroom? June Redding's historical research turned up a startling answer. Frank Whaley, who was the oldest boy in the family, organized a, what he called the Clavel Social Club. We have all the records. As a matter of fact, I think I still have some invitations somewhere. My ultimate conclusion is that somehow Sandy picked up a sound of someone practicing billiards, uh, apparently from 1905. 
Residual haunting is sort of like um, a shadow imprinted on the fabric of time. Somehow leaves an impression, a photograph, if you will, in an environment that replays and replays over and over again. And this is perhaps one of the best examples we have of retrocognitive sounds. Sounds from the past somehow impressed on the environment to be recorded uh, a century later. With his results of, of Brian's study that I'm not skeptical. And it, it's, it's kind of eerie to me. Next, a Florida investigation uncovers a spirited phenomenon known as residue haunting. The spirit of St. Petersburg High is definitely living here among us. EVP, electronic voice phenomenon, is believed to be audio residue from the past. Researchers are also finding evidence of visual residue in the form of ghost-like apparitions and moving objects. This kind of residue haunting seems to occur most often in a place of high energy and emotion, a hospital, a church, or even a school. School's in session at St. Petersburg High. Kids still run in the halls. The principal still rules with an iron fist. Only trouble is, St. Petersburg High has been closed since 1926. The spirit of St. Petersburg High is definitely living here among us. Today, St. Petersburg High School has been converted into luxury condominiums. The old school rooms and hallways where teenagers of a distant past once dreamed of the future are gone. But people who live here now still see, hear, and feel echoes from the past. A lot of people hear uh, giggling and laughing in the hallways. People hear kids running down the hallways. <laughs> I witnessed probably the most spectacular, brightest white light I have ever seen in my entire life. We've had lights go on and off in the middle of the night for no reason, and we've had you know, a couple nights where we heard you know, big band music. Have the students and teachers of yesteryear left an indelible metaphysical imprint on this historic building? Sightings called in Christopher Chacon and a team from the Office of Scientific Investigation and Research to interview the witnesses and stake out the interior with an array of state-of-the-art technology. The goal was to determine if Old St. Pete High is the site of what ghost experts refer to as residue haunting. It would be possible that the children who went to school here may have, in fact, left some type of impression behind. Among their instruments, this heat-sensitive imaging system called thermovision. It was this equipment that Chacon believes enabled his team to capture ghostly footprints on an earlier expedition. Certainly the possibility is there that the experiences people are having are in connection to the uh, students in class that were taking place back in the 1920s. In 1920, St. Petersburg, Florida dedicated a new high school. The first yearbook had a prophetic dedication. That the soul and spirit of the whole school could perhaps stay on for years to come, and which is in fact what could have happened here. St. Petersburg High was a jewel in the city's crown. In 1920, St. Pete's first class president was A.B. Fogarty. Today, he's one of the school's oldest living graduates. When I picture the school, well, I see a large, airy, well-lit building with wide halls, a nice auditorium, people busy, going to and fro to their different duties. And they had time to talk and talk to each other in those days. St. Petersburg boomed so quickly that by 1926, the charming Brick High School was too small. A larger school was built and old St. Pete was abandoned. It had a variety of tenants over the next 60 years until it was converted into condos. When the new residents moved in, they felt an eerie sense that they were not alone. And you feel like you're living in someone else's space, and you have the feeling that you should respect it. Bobby Brown had just moved into her apartment in the former science wing. She was watching television when she had her first paranormal encounter. All of a sudden, this huge shining disc that was gigantic, probably six feet across, came rolling through these windows. And when it hit the wall, it exploded into this millions of fragments of light. And the light was so bright, it nearly blinded me. 
I believe there are spirits. Um, I believe that there's an energy source that comes from an unexplained place and that probably that energy is here in this building. The individuals are very credible witnesses and the situations are uh, very simple situations that suddenly become very extraordinary because of phenomena which just cannot be classified. More than 15 different people who live here have experienced strange haunting phenomena that they simply can't explain. First, they just heard voices, laughing, giggling, childish shouts and murmurs. Then Rick Caesar, who lives in what was once the science lab, insists he saw a ghost. Well, I was in the bedroom one morning getting dressed and I saw a tall uh, man with a white shirt and a thin tie. He was kind of looking off into the conservatory, just kind of like he was looking. And then I, I said, whoa, and I backed up to look again, and he wasn't there. They may not, in fact, be individuals who are dead or have passed away coming back to haunt this location. They could, in fact, be nothing more than impressions that have been left behind in the environment that certain people are, are perceiving and sensing under certain extraordinary circumstances. That sound you hear right now? Chacon's investigation here begins with physical and psychological testing of the eyewitnesses. He monitors their sleep to determine if what they are experiencing could be a dream. Then he uses highly sensitive equipment to monitor the entire building over a 24-hour period. Thermovision allows us to visually record and document an environment in temperature variations. The night vision technology allows us to move around under complete darkness. All of these instruments work together and then we're able to look at any types of uh, abnormal phenomena or artifacts that we can correlate if something should take place. While OSIR conducted its scientific investigation, sightings walked the halls with A.B. Fogarty. It had been more than 70 years since the former class president had been here. We hoped he could help us understand why his long departed classmates might still roam the building. It's lost its airiness, its architectural creation. It's changed. It's a totally different thing, totally different. There's no reason why, if in fact someone had demolished or changed the structure, that they wouldn't have come back and actually become more active because of the fact that someone altered it. The spirit can roam anywhere, but uh, anybody's can. <laughs> the uh, spirit is the thing who we really are. The OSIR investigation turned up some unusual electromagnetic activity and cold spots in the walls, signs consistent with other reported residue hauntings. We would probably have to classify this location as, as a classic haunt. It has all the characteristics as far as its past history and also in regards to the experiences people continue to have. The current residents of Old St. Petersburg High School take pride in their building's historic stature and live in peace with the building's past. Not everyone has experienced the voices and visions, but those who have believe that no matter what happens to this building in the future, it will always be filled with school spirit. Welcome to Sightings. I'm Tim White. With Halloween Fest approaching, there are ghosts and goblins in the air. Well, at least the paper mache variety. But in England, there's one ancient site where spirits and apparitions from the past seem to hang around all year long. It's Barry Pomeroy Castle, and it's earned the title of Great Britain's most haunted landmark. The whole thing, really, about this place is, is amazing. The ghosts that occur here. We had a strange feeling there was something wrong. It just started getting pretty weird. It's always been very still, as though you're waiting for something to happen. You learn to control your imagination, because at Berry Pomeroy, if you let your imagination run away with you, you could be a raven lunatic. 
In its heyday, Barry Pomeroy Castle hosted princes, kings, and crusaders. But since 1688, no one has wanted to live within these walls. Visitors say there's something evil inside. It sounded like this. <laughs> Ghostly shrieks are heard, ghoulish apparitions are seen, and photographs have captured the dark side of the castle. The crumbling walls of this once great fortress are perched above the desolate moors that blanket southern England. It is a land of ancient superstitions, defiled tombs, and long abandoned graveyards. It's just brooding and evil. The evil is there in the atmosphere. But is it only atmosphere? Sightings has teamed up with Tony Cornell, Great Britain's premier paranormal investigator, for the first in-depth study ever conducted at Barry Pomeroy Castle. In my view, it's one of the most interesting cases I think I've come across. Basically because so many people have seen things and felt things. You don't get that in all hauntings. Uh, you waste a lot of time. But there's enough evidence that I've heard that we've got to examine this. Cornell's first step was to gather historical and anecdotal data. He sought out historian Derek Seymour, who has studied the ghostly presences here for more than 70 years. Every day I thought of this castle. If it was a lovely sunny day, I used to think, I wonder what it's looking like at the castle today. If there was a thunderstorm and the wind was howling, I used to think, oh, I wouldn't like to be at the castle today. Oh, no. The best known ghost here is the White Lady. And the White Lady is, of course, the unfortunate Lady Margaret, who is seen to walk at the top of the stairs in that tower and down in the dungeon. She is really quite frequently seen. Folklore tells of two sisters in love with the same man. Lady Margaret, the younger and more beautiful of the two, was imprisoned in the castle's dungeon by her jealous sister. There, she starved to death. Modern-day visitor Anne Benny recalls her encounter with the White Lady. When we first went down the stairs into the chamber, it was dark, it was damp, and it wasn't a nice place to be. But then this evil presence you could sense it was evil i don't know how to describe it any other way really and then i heard the footsteps very quick very light and the closer she got the more panic stricken i felt i just wanted to get out of the place and and not come back <laughs> tony cornell walked the castle grounds with jack hazard the former master stonemason of barry pomeroy it was while working here in 1986 that Hazard captured what many consider the most authentic photographic evidence of a ghostly presence here. It started to rain, and it st the wind started to blow. And I thought there was something happening unusual. So I got the disc camera out, and I took five or six shots. And on the five of the prints, white shapes came out. Whatever they were, I have no idea, but it was a most unusual Sunday morning. Sightings also heard stories of a haunting blue lady. She is thought to be the spirit of a 14th century Pomeroy who was raped by her father and then bore his child. Legend has it that she murdered the child in a fit of shame and rage. And this unfortunate child was strangled by the mother who did not want it, of course. Now, she's quite frequently seen. She's very evil, and people don't like the sight of her at all. Visitors Simon Day and Tim King believe the apparition they saw on a trip to the castle was the Blue Lady. What we saw was a figure of an elderly woman. She had a blue dress on, but you could see directly through her, and she was just staring at us, and this noise started. But when you look in the direction where it actually happened, you can't see a thing. There was nothing there. It screeched and stopped, and within a second, it was in the bush next to us. There was this really amazing screech. It scared the hell out of us. And they felt uh, that there was a power far stronger than themselves and became absolutely terrified and went. Terror also enveloped psychic investigator Bob Dolby and it would not go away. I was conducting an investigation expecting nothing at all. I was about to leave when just by the rampart walls and the stairs leading down, I saw this huge black cloud. And to me, it seemed 
probably the hugest and blackest, deepest thing I'd ever seen. Dalby claims the black cloud, what he terms the evil entity, trailed him through the castle, then followed him back to his house nearby. That same night, he tried to use a Ouija board to make contact with the terrifying presence. Is there anybody there? Aye. Yes. The glass moved erratically around the board, which was very unusual at the time. And then she made herself known. She popped up. Isabel. She struck as a very evil little girl. Through the Ouija board, they met a little girl named Isabel, who revealed that she was the bastard child of a disinherited Pomeroy from the 17th century. The Dolbys believe she spoke through the board and then actually appeared hours later in the Dolby bedroom. I actually went to bed early and left the group downstairs experimenting with the Ouija board and actually had the experience of somebody sitting on the back of my legs while I was lying on the bed thinking it was Bob messing about I told him to get off turned around and it was actually a little girl with a just a manic grin on her face well they both came to see me the next afternoon they were so terrified and I can tell you that they were frozen with shock there are hundreds of stories like these all pointing to a bizarre force that permeates these ancient limestone walls. For Tony Cornell, these subjective accounts demand an objective investigation. To me, this is probably, I go farther and say it is, the most haunted castle in England. I'm glad you brought me here. You're opening my eyes, and I think that uh, I should go back and suggest that we get in touch with British heritage and that we do a serious investigation over a period of time. There is something pretty potent here. There's a very evil force, and if ever you encounter it, I'm going to Berry Pomeroy. Get out quick. Based on the preliminary findings of our investigation, Tony Cornell believes that Berry Pomeroy Castle deserves a full-scale, long-term study. The problem is access. British Heritage, the trustees of Barry Pomeroy Castle, are not believers and so far have denied all requests for an intensive investigation. Next on Sightings, experts offer a guide to a ghostly encounter. First thing that they'll say is, you're going to think I'm crazy, but I don't think you're crazy. I've heard it all before. During this week leading up to All Hallows' Eve, Halloween, legend has it that the spirits of the dead are allowed to roam freely on the earth. What would you do if you were suddenly confronted by what seemed to be a ghost? We're often asked by viewers how to document a haunting, so we went to our experts on this most haunted of holidays, and here's what they advise. The first thing that they'll say is, you're going to think I'm crazy, but this, this is going on. And I tell them, no, I don't think you're crazy. I've heard it all before. Al Rober is a psychical researcher with over 25 years of experience investigating the paranormal. Rober's studies of haunting phenomena have taken him around the world in pursuit of hard evidence. Rober's interest in ghosts and spirits stems from his personal belief that every living being contains energy that does not die when the physical body dies. Every one of us is made up of energy. Now, when we die, what happens? Do we go into a box six feet in the ground and that energy stays there? I don't think so. The energy has to go someplace, okay? Uh, I think in cases of haunting, somehow this energy stays behind. After years of investigation, Rober has developed a checklist for anyone who believes they have seen or felt a ghost. First thing to do is to start keeping a log. Put down what happened the length of time that it happened. Put down who was there in the room at the time of the experience. If there's four people present, did all four people experience it? If the activity seems to happen more often around one certain individual, that should be noted, or in certain areas of the house. The person should drop a floor plan of the house and mark each area where activity is taking place and what activity took place there. Have a camera ready preferably a Polaroid camera, or, or a uh, tape recorder ready. Be ready to get evidence, you know, get tangible evidence of your haunting. In addition to recording every aspect of your experience, Rober suggests doing some outside research. Find out everything you can about the history of your house, the land it sits on, and other ghost phenomena that have been reported nearby. If the haunting continues and is frightening to you, Rober suggests contacting a psychic. 
There are those psychics that claim that they can actually absorb the spirit into their own person and then release it at a later time through meditation. Although psychics can help, Rober believes that the best way to deal with a haunting is to embrace it as a once in a lifetime experience. I would tell him to attempt to learn to coexist with it for the time being. If they can coexist with it, if they can somehow reduce their own tensions, then I think what they'll find is the activity will decrease. One more important step is to look for any natural occurrences that could explain away the haunting, in particular, the site's proximity to high tension wires. The physical effects of EMFs, electromagnetic fields, are hotly debated, but it does seem to have an influence in many haunting cases.